Good morning, everyone. And, and Council Member Danis Rodriguez, the Chair of the Committee on Transportation. Today, we are also joined by the Committee on Public Safety, Chair by good friend, Council Member Donovan Richard. The oversight topic for today's hearing is Vision Zero, Cyclist, Safety, and Policy, and, and, and Safety, and how the police department are enforcing but also, we, to, we will be discussing also some bills that are related to mandating all private sector who do business with the country, the city of New York, to install safeguard uh, in their trucks, uh, along establishing the three feet at the, as a distance between a uh, drivers and a cyclist. Uh, we will specifically talk about the recent increases in pedestrians and cyclist deaths that we have seen in the city. So far this year, 25 cyclists have been killed on the road, making 2009 the, dead, the deadliest year of the last two decades. Losing one cyclist or one pedestrian is too much, but this number is out of control, and we need to you know, do whatever we have to do in order to address and tackle this problem. This increase is not unique to New York City. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has recently reported that the country has seen a spike on pedestrians and cyclists' deaths. Nationwide, since 2009, pedestrian deaths have gone 69% and cyclist deaths have gone up to 48%. This is completely unacceptable, and we need to continue uh, as a city with the leadership that we have here, with individual institutions that we've been working together, uh, continue leading and setting the sample for the rest of the country on how we would like to be a more walkable and friendly uh, uh, for pedestrian and cyclist city. As transportation chairman, as everyone knows, working together with Family for Safe Streets, Transportation Alternative, and all the advocates, I have made it a priority to ensure that we keep our pedestrians and cyclists safe across the city. And we are behind those policy in the initiative, not because we are council members, but also we have children, we have daughters, we have family, and we want them to know that they're safe when they ride the bike or when they walk in our streets. We must expand and increase protected bike lanes in all boroughs, starting in the most underserved immigrants and working class community. You have seen the study, the report that most of the infrastructure on bike is basically established in the middle and upper class community. We have left the working class, mainly immigrants, black and Latino behind. And I know that this is something that we are not shy to uh, to address a situation. We know that we are trying to do the best we can. That's what we inherit as a city, and we're working to expand you know, the infrastructure, but that's what we are as today. We had, again, failed to areas such as northern Manhattan, the South Bronx, and many areas in Brooklyn, which saw the most cyclist deaths. We must double down on enforcement of vehicles that misuse and not respect the designated lane for buses and cyclists. And we have to make all intersections safe. That's one of the areas where most cyclists have been killed. Today we will hear from representatives of the police departments and the departments of transportation of what the city is doing to ensure that bike riders in all five boroughs can get where they want to go in a quick, efficient, healthy, green, and most importantly, safe manner. And this also includes the large numbers of men and women who rely on a bike, or to, on a bike to work to deliver the food, who also are part of that universal cyclists being killed in our city. Also on today's agenda are five bills that focus on bike rider safety. So far in 2009, 26 people on bike have been killed on New York City street. This is the highest number in over 20 years, and the year isn't even done yet. 
Last year, the number of cyclists killed was 10, which is 10, which is 10 people are too many. And this year, we're approaching three times that many. Because of this sharp and worrying increase, we, want, we wanted to hold a hearing, a joint hearing, uh, that focus on safety and enforcement related to cyclists. Pedestrian death and injuries are also, of course, far too high and even higher than cyclist death and injuries. New York City needs to do better and expand on its Vision Zero goals if we want our street to be safer for all street users. The street doesn't belong to car owners. And I can say I'm one of those car owners, one of the 1.4 million New Yorkers who own a vehicle. So this is not preaching to other people. It's including any one of us who own a vehicle. We can turn the city of New York, the city that by 2030, we should reduce the numbers of individuals that own vehicles from 1.4 million to 1 million. But we need to invest in the infrastructure, but at the same time, we need to be sure that we enforce. We need more street redesigns, more protected bike lane, 100 per year, that's my goal. Share street, road diet, speed cameras, pedestrian safety, island, bowlers, and much more. We need better enforcement of existing laws by the police departments and we need traffic enforcement that recognize that multi-tone cars and trucks and not bicycles are the real danger to safety on our roads. We are also considering five bills today. The first bill is intro 769 sponsored by Council Member Menchaca. The bill will allow bicyclists, bicyclists who receive violation for missing equipment such as the bells or reflectors to fix the issue within 48 hours and have the tickets dismissed. Just like drivers are allowed to make certain quick repairs after getting a ticket. The second bill, intro 1354, sponsored by council member holding, will require concrete mixing trucks to be equipped, shot shutters, or similar device to prevent the spillage of concrete or its components is component concrete spillage damage our street and while for some it may seem like a minor inconvenience for cyclists it can easily result in a crash serious injury or worse we are also hearing a bill that i introduced by request of the mayor this bill intro 1435 would supplement state law by requiring vehicle passengers 16 or older to wear seat belts in the back of in the back seat of private vehicles and vehicles licensed by the taxi and limousine commission the passenger and driver of a private vehicle will receive a 50 dollar fine if the back seat passenger wasn't wearing a seat belt and for tlc vehicles only the passenger not the driver will receive the penalty finally we are hearing two bills that i introduced the first Intro 1763 will clarify the law around drivers passing cyclists. Currently, a state law says that drivers cannot pass a cyclist unless the driver can do so at safe distance. This bill would clarify that in New York City, where of course space is a more of a premium than the rest of the state, the minimum safe distance would be three feet. This bill would bring the, the city's standards in line with a majority of the sta of a state nationwide. It is critical, critically important that drivers give cyclists enough space for the cyclists to be safe and to feel safe. This bill will give both drivers and the police department a more easy, easy apply rule to follow and enforce. The second bill I have introduced for today's hearing is a pre-considered introduction in relation to safeguards. This bill would add to previous legislation passed by this committee and the council by expanding the city's requirements for safeguards. Vehicle-based safety device 
that prevents pedestrians, cyclists, workers, and others from being caught in the otherwise <coughs> exposed space between the front and rear axles of large vehicles. First, this bill will expedite the existing timeline for side guard implementation in the city fleet and for waste hauling vehicles from 2024 to 2021. Second, this bill will expand side guard requirements to all trucks operated persons pursuant to a contract with the city. Side guards are a proven and inexpensive life saving piece of equipment and it makes sense for the city to expand their use in any way we can. Hoy estamos trabajando con legislaciones que tienen la intención de hacer de la calle de Nueva York calle segura para proteger a los ciclistas y a los peatones. Es una audiencia junta con el compañero Donovan Richard en el que nosotros vamos a escuchar de la policía, el departamento de transportación, qué se está haciendo para que la calle de Nueva York sea segura para todos. Además de que es segura para los choferes, que sea segura para los peatones y los ciclistas. También hoy estamos, vamos a escuchar cómo hemos llegado a tener 30 ciclistas muertos en, en este año en comparación de los días anteriores. Y hoy buscamos también que la ciudad de Nueva York dé un ejemplo a nivel de la nación porque hemos tenido un aumento de ciclistas y peatones perdiendo la vida en la nación completa por que choferes lamentablemente no respetan las leyes. I now turn it over to Council Member Donovan Richard, the Chair of the Public Safety Committee, to deliver his opening statement. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez. And before I begin, I just want to ask everybody to stand uh, for all of those we lost. We'll have a quick moment of silence for all those we lost this year. Thank you. May be seated. Good afternoon. I am Donovan Richards of the 31st District in Queens, and I am the chair of the Public Safety Committee. Today, I want to be clear about what this hearing is not about. This hearing is not about cyclists versus drivers versus pedestrians. It's not about assigning blame to one group or another. It's not about us versus them. Sorry, Siri. Many people who drive also ride bikes. We all want this city to be safe for everyone. This hearing is about the fact that 26 people have been killed this year while riding their bikes and what the city plans to do to resolve the problem. This hearing is about the NYPD strategy for saving lives through targeted enforcement of the vehicle and traffic law, what they've done in the past, what has been shown to work, what hasn't worked, and what they plan to do going forward. Let's talk about what hasn't worked, because I think there is some agreement here. What hasn't worked is this. In the wake of cyclists being killed, police officers being sent out to the very same intersections and issuing t tickets to cyclists. Sometimes it got so bad they would issue tickets for things that aren't even illegal, like not wearing a helmet. We need to understand that was why that was happening in the first place, because it feels a lot like victim blaming. I appreciate that Chief Monahan has publicly stated that it was insensitive and it won't happen anymore, but I still need to know a few things. Why was that happening to begin with? Who approved those tactics? Is there any data showing that those efforts reduce fatalities or injuries? Or was this just a knee-jerk reaction? I'm not going to ask those questions to point fingers. It's important to recognize the thinking so we can correct it. I want to know how the department instructed its precincts to discontinue that practice so we can make sure it doesn't happen again. I also want to know what the enforcement strategy is going forward and what that strategy is based on. We have limited resources and we should spend those resources on things that actually work to reduce injuries and fatalities. I'm not saying that cyclists shouldn't have to follow the law, 
but the data shows that the overwhelming majority of injuries and fatalities are caused by motor vehicles, not cyclists. I want to make sure that the department is focused on the behaviors that are truly responsible for causing those unnecessary deaths. Finally, we need to make sure that the culture of the department is one that supports cyclist safety and encourages people to bike safely. That means not parking in bike lanes unless there is an emergency, treating cyclists with respect, and conducting a thorough and unbiased investigation when there is a collision. I know we are moving in the right direction, so I'm looking forward to hear what the members of the NYPD and the Department of Transportation have to say today. Thank you, Chairman. Now I ask the Committee Council to administer the information and invite you to deliver your opening statement. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Rodriguez, Chairman Richards, <coughs> excuse me, and members of the Transportation and Public Safety Committees. I'm Polly Trottenberg, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Transportation. With me today are Eric Beaton, Deputy Commissioner for Transportation Planning and Management, and Rebecca Zack, Assistant Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Community Affairs. We're happy to be here together with our colleagues from NYPD on behalf of the de Blasio administration to testify on cyclist safety, our Green Wave plan for cycling in New York City, and some of the legislation before the committee today. Before I begin my testimony, I want to take a moment to note the tragic death this week of fellow DOT employee Eduardo Calle Abril, who served on our Roadway Repair and Maintenance Division. Tragically, Eduardo was struck and killed by an agency truck while he performed paving work on the Upper East Side earlier this week. Our thoughts and prayers are with Eduardo's family, friends, and coworkers. DOT and the mayor's office are doing everything we can to help Eduardo's family at this heartbreaking time. This is also a painful moment for our entire DOT family. This tragedy reminds us all of the incredibly difficult and sometimes dangerous work the men and women of DOT perform every day to make sure our roads, bridges, sidewalks, ferries, and other infrastructure are safe for all New Yorkers. I'm grateful to all the men and women of DOT for the dedication they bring to these challenging jobs. Now turning to today's hearing, increasing the number of people cycling makes our city a better place to live and will help keep us at the forefront of sustainability. As the city grows, I want to emphasize that cycling is an efficient, sustainable, enjoyable, and overall quite safe way of getting around our city. And at DOT, many of us, myself included, are frequent cyclists. We strongly encourage cycling and have made it substantially safer than it's been in the past, but we know we also need to do much more. Too often, cyclist trips end in tragedy, especially with 2019's sharp increase in cyclist fatalities, which have tragically run contrary to our five-year trend of improving overall roadway safety citywide. In response this summer, the mayor released our Green Wave plan, I think all of you have a copy in front of you, a long-term citywide vision for enhancing cycling safety and improving the riding experience for cyclists. In this plan, we've committed to building 30 miles of protected bike lanes annually, guided by the vision document that you can see up here on the poster, install over 80 miles of protected bike lanes by the end of 2021, build 75 miles of bicycle infrastructure in bicycle priority districts, neighborhoods outside the central core that the chairman referenced that have high ridership but lack adequate bicycle infrastructure by 2022, apply innovative intersection designs in at least 50 locations in 2019 with a focus on high fatality areas and where possible, protected intersection designs will be added after streets are resurfaced and reconstructed, and pilot green wave progressive signal timing that discourages speeding and encourages steady cycling speeds and identify other corridors for improvement in 2020. And there'll be much more, including a targeted truck safety initiative and continued expansion of cyclist outreach and helmet giveaways. For the green wave plan, the city has committed $58.4 million in new funding over the next five years with 80 additional new staff, representing a 75% increase in DOT staff who solely support bike lane infrastructure. And we'll be growing many parts of DOT. For 2019, we expect to install between 20 and 25 miles of protected bike lanes. These include a number of projects in the Manhattan core, such as crosstown lanes on 52nd and 55th streets, filling the 2nd Avenue gap at the Queensboro Bridge, 
new lanes on 10th Ave in Amsterdam, 11th Ave, 8th Avenue, and Columbus Circle, and phase one of our Central Park protected bike lane. Our projects also include the 4th Avenue bike lane in Brooklyn from 1st to 60th Streets, Cypress Hill Street in Queens and Brooklyn, and Willis Ave in the Bronx. And yesterday, we celebrated our 100th mile of protected bike lanes under the de Blasio administration on Fountain Avenue in East New York, where we've created a connection to the beautiful new Shirley Chisholm State Park. In addition, we've installed offset crossings on 1st, 2nd, and 5th Aves in Manhattan after resurfacing, and we will meet our 2019 goal of installing at least 20 miles of bike infrastructure in our bicycle priority districts. Implementing the Grieveway Plan will not be easy. The city is committing substantial new resources, and we will need to take on new operational and political challenges. The plan will need to continue to evolve over time to reflect public input and how the city is growing and changing. But under Mayor de Blasio's leadership, we've created a plan that is realistic, has the necessary resources and personnel, and meets the urgency of this moment. Making cycling, cycling safer is our relentless goal, and one that is not achieved all at once or by any single entity. It will require continual enhancement of cycling infrastructure, targeted enforcement, including holding dangerous drivers accountable, effective public education, and ongoing work to pass and strengthen state and local laws that make our streets safer, including some of the bills we're here to discuss today. And it will require collaboration of city agencies, elected officials, local businesses and institutions, neighborhood residents, advocates, and other stakeholders. But we at DOT look forward to aggressively pursuing this vital work with all our partners. Now to turn to the legislation before the committee, starting with the bill to require more side guards. Side guards are rail or panel style pieces added between the wheels of large vehicles that can reduce serious injuries and deaths by preventing pedestrians and cyclists from rolling or falling underneath. DOT supports the bill with some amendments and we look forward to further discussions with you on the bill, Mr. Chairman. DOT strongly supports the implementation of side guard requirements for the BIC and city fleets currently required by 2024 as soon as feasibly possible. Thanks to DCAS's leadership, New York City deploys the largest number of side guards in North America, over 2,700 vehicles, representing 55% of the city fleet, with more installations daily. The city now uses trucks with side guards across numerous agencies, including DOT, DESNY, DEP, NYPD, FDNY, DOC, DOH, DCAS, NYCHA, and Parks. When DCAS started this work, there was only one vendor in North America selling truck guards. The city has helped develop this market, and we're working with four suppliers and five installers, all of whom we've certified through our continuing partnership with USDOT. And as we called for in our Safer Cycling Report and reiterated in Green Wave, we support expanding this requirement to city vendors and look forward to further discussions with the council and our city partners on implementation. A new requirement for city vendors could build on DCAS's existing system for determining which makes, models, and configurations of vehicles are suitable for side guards, and for those, which products and installers work best. I will say that as policymakers add more and more layers and requirements onto, onto the city contracting process, each of which are worthy in and of themselves, cumulatively, it makes it harder to do business with the city and for us to attract capable and affordable vendors, especially MWBEs. So new requirements should be carefully tailored. We recommend the council consider applying the requirement to contracts above a certain size. The city of Chicago, for example, includes the requirements on contracts over two million. Another Chairman Rodriguez bill would require drivers to provide at least three feet between their vehicle and a cyclist while passing. The current safe passing law enacted at the state level at 2010 is vague. And so DOT supports a clearer requirement. Currently, 28 states, including California, Florida, Illinois, and the District of Columbia, require at least three feet of passing distance. Doing the same under New York City local law would provide specific, easily understandable guidance to motorists and a stronger educational tool. And we support intro 1354 by Councilmember Holden with minor amendments. DOT has identified concrete spillage as having a significant detrimental impact on our roadways and posing a particular hazard to cyclists. And it can be presented with a simple piece of equipment that costs a few hundred dollars, which the proposed law would require for all loaded concrete trucks while traveling in New York City. I'll just note in my testimony, my testimony, I apologize, we have the number for side guards instead of the concrete spillage cap, so we will fix that. But it's just a few hundred dollars for this device. And while the law empowers DOT to inspect for compliance, the bill we think would be greatly enhanced if NYPD as well as DOP, DOB and DEP 
the agencies that are responsible for enforcement in construction and aspects of the concrete industry could enforce as well. We think the bill's noticeably, uh, notably bipartisan support is a, is a clear testament to the frustration caused by this careless damage to our roads, and we look forward to working with the sponsor of the bill to see it passed. Lastly, intro 1435 by Chairman Rodriguez at the request of the mayor, while not directly related to cyclist safety, is a key step the city can take on Vision Zero. 28 states in the District of Columbia require rear seat belt use by those 16 and above. Since 2012, Hawaii, Illinois, Kansas, Maryland, Minnesota, and Texas have mandated rear seat belt use for adults. According to the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration and National Occupant Protection Use Survey data, rear seat passengers are three times more likely to die if unbelted. And rear seat belt use is higher in states with rear seat belt laws, 83% versus those without at 74%. Currently in New York State, all drivers and front seat passengers are required to wear a seat belt in both private and for hire vehicles, but in the rear seat, only minors are required to buckle up. In analyzing crash reports, we found that a significant number of preventable traffic fatalities in New York City involve lack of seat belt use by rear seat passengers. Requiring seat belt use in all cases is increasingly a best practice nationally, is strongly supported here in New York by AAA Northeast at the state level, and is a concrete step we should take to achieve Vision Zero. Under the VTL, New York City may establish laws to regulate the use of required equipment in vehicles. Pursuant to that authority, the proposed legislation would create a traffic infraction punishable by a fine of up to $50 for backseat passengers, 16 years or over, not using a seatbelt. And it would add a violation for drivers who fail to ensure seatbelt use of their rear adult passengers as well, other than those drivers transporting passengers for hire. We believe an additional violation for the driver, similar to the law in California and at least four other states, provides the strongest and most enforceable provision. Most importantly, this law would significantly aid in our public education by letting us promote the, passage, the message that all passengers in all vehicles in all positions must wear their seatbelt by law. We appreciate the opportunity for the bill to have a hearing and urge its speedy passage. In conclusion, Mayor de Blasio has pledged to New Yorkers that this administration would do everything we could to end traffic fatalities. Thanks to the mayor's leadership and the effective work of so many in the advocacy community, we're proud to put forward the Green Wave plan and are hard at work in making it a reality with all of our partners, especially many of you here on the council. We've assembled a long and aggressive to-do list that we think can help address this year's tragic increase in cyclist fatalities and encourage even more New Yorkers to get on bicycles. Thank you for inviting us to testify today. We welcome your questions. Good morning, Chair Rodriguez. Sorry. Good morning, Chair Rodriguez, Chair Richards, and members of the council. I am Thomas Chan, the Chief of the, Chief of the Transportation Bureau in the New York City Police Department. In addition to my colleagues from the Department of Transportation, I'm joined here by Deputy Chief Michael Pilecki and Michael Clark, the, the Managing Attorney of Legislative uh, Affairs Unit. Um, on behalf of the Police Commissioner, James P. O'Neill, I wish to thank the Council for the opportunity to speak today about the Department's efforts to ensure the safety of our cyclists on our streets and also to comment on some of the bills being heard today. Before discussing the bills under consideration today, I would like to speak about what the New York City Police Department is doing to keep our cyclists, pedestrians, drivers safe and on our crowded streets. Last year, the city recorded the fewest traffic fatality since we began tracking traffic deaths in 1910. This year, we are on pace for the second fewest fatalities during the same period. In the previous decade, for more than 300 individuals lost their lives on our streets each year. The vision of this administration and combined efforts of the Department of Transportation and the New York City Police Department has reduced the number of lives lost by approximately 100 pe persons per year. The standards and the goals for safety have rightfully changed and we will not be satisfied until no family is left grieving for their loved ones because of a traffic fatality. As the Chief of Transportation, I am responsible for the ensuring the safety of all New Yorkers as they travel within and also around New York City. And as a cyclist myself, this is a topic that is deeply personal to me. Each fatality on our streets is one fatality too many. Each family that must grieve for their loved one is a family too many. 
the department is committed to ensuring that our streets are safe for all those who wish to share them. As the city progresses toward a more friendly, bike-friendly future, the cyclist remains one of the cornerstones, safety remains one of the cornerstones of our Vision Zero. Commissioner Trottenberg already spoke in length about the important innovations in the mayor's Green Wave bicycle plan, but I would like to highlight the NYPD's role in the enforcement aspects of Green Wave and also Vision Zero in general. We have stepped up the enforcement of blocked bike lanes and hazardous driving violations, leading to a sharp increase over the last year in summonses for both parking and moving uh, bike lane violations, as well as summonses for failure to yield to our pedestrians and bicyclists. In July, we began a three-week initiative focused on enforcement relative to parking in bike lanes, an operation that has extended at least to the end of the year. Since July, we are up 28.5% in bike lane summonses. We are continuing to focus our enforcement on seven of the, the other dangerous moving violations. We also refer as Vision Zero violations. We've written approximately 220,000 more summonses for these categories of violations last year and in 2013. 485,178 versus 704,284. The Department and the Department of Transportation continually collaborate in studying collision trends, analyzing the conditions that contribute and increase in fatalities, which allows us to efficiently and poignantly steer our enforcement efforts to the most at-risk locations and on the most dangerous violations. This has led us to decrease in overall collisions and pedestrians over the last year. As an example, I want to highlight the work that we did last month in September. September has presented unique challenges with children going back to school and more school buses on the road. And unfortunately, last year in September ended with the highest number of pedestrian fatalities in some time. With this in mind, this September, we strategically deployed traffic safety teams to high risk areas in eight separate targeted initiatives. These efforts, along with overall increased focus on enforcement against drivers who fail to yield to pedestrians and cyclists, help contribute to the decrease of 44% in pedestrian fatalities over last September. We are always analyzing what works and what is less effective. We take these lessons into the future enforcement initiatives to further hone their effectiveness. While recognizing these gains and improvements, we are all very troubled with the significant increase in cyclist fatalities this year. In addition to the considerable work of DOT in response to these tragedies, the department has also revamped its investigation protocols whenever there is a collision between an automobile and a cyclist. These instances, a supervisor will arrive on the scene to evaluate whether or not the motorist failed to yield to the pedestrian or the cyclist. Additionally, our collision investigation squad continues to vigorously investigate all fatalities, serious injuries where the individual is likely to die, and also critical injuries when called to the scene. And we make criminal arrests where appropriate. We'll also target areas that are particularly high incidences of collision with outreach campaigns. We attempt to educate drivers, bike, bicyclists, pedestrians on how to operate safely in these shared and awful congested spaces. This is certainly on the top of the work that we do along with the Department of Transportation to promote safe driving, bicycling, and walking. Everybody, regardless of their methods of transportation, owes a duty to each other to traverse in these shared spaces as safely as possible, and we are committed to helping ensure responsible use of our streets. We would like to further comment on some of the bills that are under consideration that are of interest to the department. Intro number 769 would require the NYPD to cancel summonses issued to missing bicycle equipment if the cyclist is able to demonstrate to the department within 48 hours that the condition has been cured. The department's ultimate goal is to promote safety. If an individual is able to cure the defect that led to their citation, the department does not oppose canceling the summonses. However, 
the NYPD is not the correct avenue for canceling such violations. A court or other independent final arbiter is best suited to adjudicate these issues, as it is currently the case with certain violations, such as non-functioning tail light. Intro number 1435. I would, 1435 would require backseat passengers who are 16 and over to use safety belts, enforceable against both the unbelted passenger and the driver, except drivers of four higher vehicles. Requiring rear safety belts will undoubtedly save lives, and the department supports this legislation. Intro number 1763 would make it a violation for a motor vehicle operator to fail to maintain a distance of at least three feet from a cyclist when overtaking. As Commissioner Tronsenberg noted, the specific three-foot requirement would lend clarity to an otherwise vague concept under the state law and would present an opportunity to publicly highlight these dangers. Thank you for this opportunity to speak about this critical issue, and I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. I would like to acknowledge uh, Councilmember Ku, Aaron Dodge, Reynoso, Holden, Miller, Cabrera, Espinal, Menchaca, Brian, Rose, Powers, and Levine, who are also joining us today. Uh, how do you feel as, you know, the leader of, the joint leaders of this initiative to, you know, to reduce to zero the number of pedestrian and cyclists being killed that, and this is not about blaming the mayor, neither of you, but I say as a city, how do you feel with this big increase of that, you know, numbers of cyclists being killed, you know, when we were able to accomplish that goal? And what do you think are the causes for that increase? I'm happy to answer, and maybe my colleagues from PD will as well. I mean, look, I, I've, I've said it many times, obviously, we're breathing pretty heavily for all the fatalities that we have seen this summer, and you know I think we think the Green Wave is a very big commitment to do everything we can think of on the agency side and NYPD and some of our sister agencies to continue to tackle that. You know I would contextualize in general about Vision Zero, and all of you have the Green Wave in front of you. If you look at page five, it shows you. Now this was from the summer. Obviously, unfortunately, these numbers have grown, but it shows you the cyclist fatality numbers throughout the years. Those numbers have moved around a lot. Last year we had an extraordinarily safe year for cyclists and it was the safest year on record in New York City on our roadways. This year we've had this terrible spike in cyclist fatalities. The vast majority of them have been in Brooklyn. In the other boroughs, the numbers have not been nearly so high. In, in some cases, they've been even a little better than average. And you know, our agencies have spent a lot of time trying to dig through what we think is happening. We have some theories that we've talked about. One thing we're seeing, particularly, I'm looking at, at Councilmember Menchaca and Reynoso, in areas that were formerly very industrial. A lot of trucks, a lot of heavy construction activity that are becoming more residential. Where cycling is more popular, we're unfortunately seeing a lot of collisions with cyclists and trucks. And you know, part of what the Green Wave talks about is ways we can work with the trucking community to make things safer and getting side guards installed, which we want to work with you on. You know, that's one place where unfortunately we're seeing a growing number of collisions. We're also seeing, you, you referenced the national trends, Mr. Chairman, we're seeing this in New York as well, increased use of SUVs. And, you know, SUVs, when an SUV has a collision, tends to be going at a faster speed, harder stopping distance, and it's a much weightier vehicle and the center of gravity is higher when it hits a pedestrian or a cyclist, much more likely to do serious or fatal damage. You know, I think those are a couple of the trends we're seeing. Um, and, you know, we are t trying, I think, best we can on the infrastructure side to work, you know, as fast as we can in those areas where we're seeing a huge influx of residents into what were formerly industrial areas. And then I think PD can, can speak about what they're seeing on the, the, the enforcement side. 
But I, I've said this before, we've had five years of declining fatalities in New York City on our roadways. This year, even with the tragic spike in cyclist fatalities, overall, as, as my colleague Chief Chan said, we, we on track to be the second safest year on our roadways. And you know, we've always said about Vision Zero, unfortunately, progress is not gonna be linear. And you know, when we see a very bad you know, trend happening as we have this summer, we are you know, pulling together every agency resource in terms of dollar and personnel and mustering you know, political and community support to take as many steps as we can. And I think PD can speak on the enforcement side. And as we take a look at uh, during the course of the year, the, the collisions have occurred, and uh, we certainly agree that the popularity uh, and the use of um, uh, bicycles as a means of transportation to and from work has certainly increased uh, dramatically in New York City. Uh, unfortunately, as there are more bicyclists on the roadway, uh, the contacts may increase between the uh, vehicles and the bicyclists itself. We've taken a, a close look at that, and certainly, as we mentioned uh, previously before, um, uh, when we have a collision between a motorist and a cyclist or, or, or a pedestrian, we are sending our patrol supervisors out there to oversee, to make sure that the, uh, uh, the individuals who are uh, uh, responsible for the collision are gonna be held responsible. If we see that the individual um, did fail to yield to the pedestrian or the bicyclist, we are going to issue them a summons for that, and we have done that, and of recent, we've included um, Probably in the last six months, we've had uh, the patrol supervisor also respond in conjunction for the bicyclist who was injured on the roadway. Uh, we see uh, the trend that we identified it. We are, we are saddened by uh, this, especially with, with the success that we've had in the last five years in Vision Zero. Uh, we will continue to work closely on the education, uh, our outreach unit, and all along with the, the Transportation Bureau, has, um, DOT has also continued to do education with uh, our motorists and our bicyclists out there, and we will continue those efforts. But one of the major things for the New York City Police Department is that um, we've conducted uh, more initiatives this year than we have in the past, specifically targeting behavior of motorists that are failed to yielding to our pedestrians and our cyclists out there, and that will certainly have an adverse impact on them on the roadways. So therefore, it, it's uh, through precision policing, we're identifying the locations, we focus our enforcement at bicyclist collision prone locations, pedestrian collision prone locations where we identify uh, if there are collisions there and that people are injured, but also that we're proactively looking for additional locations by going to corridors where we have injuries and we've done outreach on that during the course of the year. And ultimately, uh, what we've seen this year for the bicycle injuries, we saw that fr from the start of the year, the bicycle injuries had um, gone up during the course of the year. And uh, at one point, close to the summer itself, we saw that uh, it, had, it was, there were probably over 100 more injuries than there were last year. Um, as of this past Sunday, that great decrease, we've been able to target violations, and we have actually have one additional injury compared to last year. But at one point uh, during this, uh, the year, we were up 13% in injuries of bicyclists and things of that nature. Right now, we are targeting the right-of-way infraction to motorists when they fail to yield to our pedestrians and also our bicyclists. And we feel that we are now focused in the right area and we are seeing the results where at this point, our collisions are down 7% for the year. Our pedestrian injuries are down 5% for the year. And finally, as I said, during the course of the year, the bicycle injuries were up the, pretty much uh, the whole nine months. Um, as of this past Sunday, we have one injury more than we did last year. But if we continue on this trend, my expectation is that too will continue to go down because we're targeting the right violation in terms of uh, protecting our bicyclists and our pedestrians. But we had 30 cyclists being killed, right, this year? That's the number? 25 listed. 25? Yes. This is the worst year, right, that we have? Yes. 
So, and, and what I would like to see, and I know that this is what the advocate would like to see, is like all enforcement should be toward drivers and not spending the time and resources for the police officer to going after giving tickets to the cyclists. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I can talk about the local level. Mm -hmm. I have seen in my district, the 34, police officer has given tickets to the labor workers, cyclists, not in the sidewalk, yes, in the street, not putting at risk the life of any pedestrian. So what I might, you know, as we have to continue this conversation and, you know, putting forces and ideas together, my call is that, you know, stop ticketing cyclists, let's focus on the drivers, because they are the one that cause the crashes that we have in our street. But my other question is on, first of all, do you know, do you, what is the estimate? How many New Yorkers or visitors own and use bicycle in our street? Because I assume that number is necessary in order to plan, right? I have that number, I'm just gonna find it here, apologize. Oh yes, here we go. Uh, no, let's bust this. Does anyone have that number? Oops. Oh yeah, here we go. I apologize, found my numbers. Um, our estimated numbers, and we use surveys and bike counters and a bunch of w different ways to get at this activity is that about 24% of adult New Yorkers, nearly 1.6 million people, ride a bike with some number of frequency um, the number of people who bike to work in New York City um, grew actually two times faster than in other major cycling cities over the period from 2012 to 2014. And just where NAP, I think I've given the statistics, were about half a million daily cycling trips, which is 55% growth since 2012 and 134% growth since 2007. So look, there, there's no question that cycling has grown tremendously in the city and has become an increasingly popular mode. Just, I'll speak about another piece of the statistics, which you know we are very excited about. We are continuing right now to expand the city bike system, which just, as you all may recall, came into operation at the end of 2013. We are now seeing regular daily ridership of over 50,000. We have well over 150,000 members. This summer we had one of our busiest cycling days on City Bike Alone was over 90,000 trips. So, you know, there's no question, I think as, as Chief Chan alluded to the fact, um, you know, we, we believe in the safety of numbers phenomenon. We wanna get more New Yorkers on bikes, but it's true with that extraordinary growth, unfortunately at times we are seeing increased collisions between, again, particularly I think cyclists and trucks is an area where we've seen, unfortunately this year in particular, a real uptick. Commissioner, when, I just have two more questions that I pass it to my colleagues. On one question is intersections. Like, uh, how, if we look at how the DOT, where the DOT is today, what challenges do we have when it comes to intersections? How much more resources do we need to plug in? Is there funding from the federal government as in the past? I know that there was some funding coming, you know, from uh, at the federal level, especially with the approach to make intersections safer for cyclists and pedestrians. Can yeah, you take I'll, us there? I will speak about that. I, I will also want Deputy Commissioner Beaton to speak about that. And I know that's also been a big focus for Chief Chan in terms of enforcement. I mean, intersections are particularly the place where cyclists and vehicles collide. And all too often, and, and pedestrians as well, I might add. And it all too often, it's a scenario where a vehicle is turning, a cyclist or a pedestrian is in their blind spot and a, you know, a tragedy occurs. We have committed to a very aggressive program of all types of redesign treatments at our intersections, and some of you have even seen them. We've piloted them throughout the city. Left turn calming treatments where we put in bollards or sort of raised bumps in the road which slow cars down as they turn. 
We've embarked on a whole set of new redesigns for places where we have bike lanes and they come into intersections. And I'll actually, I'll let Deputy Commissioner Beaton speak a bit more in detail about that. It, sure, and obviously intersections are they're where the, the cars and the pedestrians and the bicyclists come together and they're naturally the place we need to focus on to make, make sure cycling is safe. Uh, we have a series of treatments that we use that include what we call a mixing zone where uh, cyclists come in and sort of have to merge with cars. We, we, while we haven't seen these as being unsafe, we've heard loud and clear from the cycling community that people don't feel safe and that that's something that really affects cycling. And so we've really taken a hard look both at our mixing zone design, to, we've shortened them and made sure that the markings are clearer. But we've also been using more different treatments like what people often call a protected intersection where rather than merging, there's sort of a single point where a car is supposed to wait and sort of make eye contact or where a driver makes eye contact with a cyclist and be able to navigate that intersection well. We had piloted these last year at a couple intersections, did a very robust set of data collection, including both interviews, but also looking at video to see what types of interactions were happening between cyclists and drivers and found that at least in certain circumstances, they were increasing safety. And as, as a result, that's something we've now built into the new protected bike lanes we're doing going forward. But we're also going back and looking at where are those places where we can make our intersections safer with these turn calming treatments with protected intersections. Certainly as we repave streets, as we repaved quite a number of bike lanes this past year, we're going back and putting those in. But we're not just stopping there. Where it's the right thing to do, we have a whole group that, that just goes and redesigns intersections to make sure that they're meeting our highest level of safety. So there, we have a lot out there and there's more to do, but we really want to keep pushing the envelope on intersection design. Making my case in the call for the city to separate the light for pedestrians and cyclists. Have we seen it that in many of those cyclists that they lost their life after being hit by a vehicle in those inter intersections were delighted or organized in a way that it was separated for pedestrians and drivers? So I, I'll jump in on that and er Eric may want to add, I mean, one thing we have implemented th thanks to council member Ben Shaka now is allowing cyclists. One thing we're doing throughout the city, it, it had been, Previously, the department had been very conservative on the use of LPIs, leading pedestrian intervals, and, and we have now really changed that policy and embraced it, and we are putting them in by the hundreds all over the city, and you know, they're immensely popular. They give pedestrians a head start to start walking before we allow vehicles to go and vehicles to turn. It gets the pedestrians further out into the intersections. Vehicles can see them, and, and we think they've been tremendous for safety. Thanks to the council and Councilmember Menchaca, you all have given us now the authority to also allow bicycles to go when they get that LPI signal. And we had worked carefully with our NYPD colleagues to make sure that that was gonna be safe for everybody, pedestrians included. It has, and so now we're doing that. And we think that is going to be, you know, we will together as we put LPIs all over the city, making things safer for cyclists and pedestrians. There are places where we have cyclist only signal, I'll let Eric speak about that. It, it can tend to sometimes make the, the traffic configuration of an intersection get quite complex. Yeah, and, and one thing that I, I wanna start by saying is that bike lanes and protected bike lanes in particular are an incredible improvement in safety for cyclists. No, no matter what type of intersection treatment, no matter what type of signalization, where we have a protected bike lane, even where we have a standard bike lane, that level of infrastructure makes a huge difference in keeping cyclists safe. And when there's been a very, very small number of cyclist fatalities that have happened on our protected bicycle lanes, and they've almost always been a, a case where someone has done something incredibly egregious, like a, a vehicle turning left from the far right of the street, something that would not be covered, you know, it's people who are blatantly violating traffic laws. So we want to keep them, keep everyone safe we want to make sure everyone follows the rules. There's some limit to how much, you know, if someone is, is intentionally not following our traffic rules, they will run a red light, they will do other things. We do look at the, what we often call a split phase where uh, cyclists and, and pedestrians and traffic go at different times. 
What we want to do is create a culture of compliance where we create a street that people don't feel a need to run red lights. And when we look at videos and look at how cyclists behave, if we do that in the wrong place, a cyclist will get frustrated because they don't see other traffic moving and they'll start to, to go through the light. And the same for, for vehicles. If they don't feel like they, they, there's enough other traffic around, they'll start to run the red turn signal. And so we want to use those at places with very high volumes of cyclists, pedestrians, and turns where it is really needed to keep everyone safe. But we also want to create a place where everyone can keep moving where that's the best thing to do. And so we do use different treatments at different types of intersections. When the cyclists lost their life, mm -hmm. happened in an intersection where the time for drivers and cyclists and, and pedestrians was divided, separated. They, they varied, but in general, they happened on streets that didn't but have I, bicycle. Is, they, 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 they no, no, so my question is if in any of the 25 cases, did that intersection use had device separated the time for them, cyclists and pedestrians, and drivers? Most of the streets did not even have a bike lane. Was that? Most, most of these streets did not even have a bike lane on it, and not, let alone a separate signal for cyclists. So in, the, in none of those intersections, that's my question, we have those intersections with the street lighting separating between drivers and cyclists and pedestrians. Uh, that, that is correct. Okay. It, most of them did not have any bike infrastructure at all, which we think is incredibly important for cyclist safety. Okay. I just want to see how, especially how the data uh, that you, you, know, as you and your team being able to look at it. Mm -hmm. Because again, I have seen in many of those intersections, I will assume that based on what I have seen, but we need to rely on the data. Mm -hmm. There's less crashes in those intersections, even though it, it, delay the time for drivers or someone get frustrated, but for me it's all about the safety part. And, and my last question before I pass it to my colleague is about how many of those 25 cases involve hit and run? Actually, do you all, I think the PD has the hit and run statistics. If we don't have it, we can show it us. Like, we'll, we'll get it to you. I don't want to give you, at the top of, my, top of my head, I don't believe any of those are hit and run uh, from those 25 cases that we have recorded. I'll double check in a second. Okay, and how many of those uh, resulted on the driver being charged? Councilman, um, while we're waiting, he'll tally up and we'll give it to you in a minute or two, okay? But we can move on if you like. And before- We'll get, we'll get you that information specific, okay? Okay, before, before we, and the colleague has a question I'd like to ask, and one of the person from, friend of family for Safe Street, whose girlfriend was killed exactly three years ago, so please come in front of you here. Just hope to read the name. You can read the list, that list, and then we're gonna read the other list. Okay, so just introduce myself. Yeah, and then read the name. All right, my name is Mirza Molberg, and um, I'm here for Families for Safe Streets, and I also volunteer with the Ghost Bike Project. We put up the white bikes that are put on the street as memorials for cyclists who have been killed in New York City. Um, and my girlfriend, Loren Davis, was killed three years ago on Classen Avenue in Brooklyn. Um, so I'm here to read the names of the cyclists who were killed in New York. Um, okay. So Hector Ayala, uh, age 41. Susan Moses, age 63. Chaim Joseph, age 72, Aurelia Lawrence, age 25, 
Robert Spencer, age 53. Pedro de Posteco, age 26. Robert Summer, age 29. Kenichi Nakagawa, age 22. Yisroel Schwartz, age 16. Victor Eng, age 74. And Robin Heitman, age 20. We're going to be reading a name. We're going to be passing. Ernest, stay here. Ernest Oscar, 57. David, Deborah Friedlander, 28. Donald Robert, 47. Mario Valenzuela, 14. Dalojan Jahobidanov, age 10. Bogdan Darmetko, age 65. Hugo Garcia, age 26. Mohamed Abdullah, age 29. Charles Chisbero, 43. Lastly, MD Abu Bashar, 62. Thank you. So this is much, too many. Thank you, uh, Chairman. So I'm going to get right down to uh, business, and my questions were really centered around NYPD and enforcement. Uh, earlier this year, we saw several enforcement actions targeting cyclists after a cyclist's death at the very same intersection where the death occurred. I know Chief Monahan said publicly that this practice was discontinued, and my question to you, uh, Chief Chan, is can you explain the rationale behind uh, doing enforcement actions after the death of a cyclist? I'm just going to follow up very quickly uh, uh, Councilman Rodriguez's uh, uh, question in reference to how many arrests. We have four arrests in reference to these 25 cases. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, the issuance of summonses to bicyclists at locations where uh, bicyclists um, were um, injured or, or, or fatalities at those locations, uh, previously um, we instituted a a post-collision analysis and also enforcement at those locations for a 72-hour period. And what happened is that our officers, uh, men and women, will go out there, be deployed, and they'll do enforcement at those particular intersections or locations. And again, they would not necessarily look at uh, whether it be a bicyclist or a motorist. They basically uh, issued summonses for violations they observed at those locations, and they did not um, take a look at uh, the cyclists that were um, uh, that are going through that location, and one of the things that we've spoken to the community, we've listened to the groups, and we understand uh, their concern. And ultimately, um, um, uh, working with uh, Chief Monahan, uh, the decision was made to make sure that uh, we did not issue summonses to the bicyclists at those particular locations, because again, it appeared that we were being insensitive on that. But ultimately, our officers, and you know, when we deploy them, we don't say that, well, only give me certain types of cars or, or, or don't. We ask them to do enforcement when we see violations out there. Uh, but again, that was taken into consideration and the decision was made not to. So you'd them. agree that was insensitive uh, and that yes, the department stands? Yes, that could be stands. perceived as being Perce insensitive, okay. yes. And, uh, and that has, how has that been communicated to precinct commanders? What happened is that uh, that certainly was shared uh, to all the precinct commanders, the, uh, the borough commanders and executive officers. Uh, we have the forum of traffic stat where we have one borough each week come into uh, police headquarters uh, where we review their uh, 
traffic programs. We take a look at what they're focusing on to make sure that they are um, doing the enforcement in the areas that need enforcement, focusing their enforcement on pedestrian injury locations, uh, also uh, bicycle injury locations, to make sure that our program is effective. So we share this message, and it's gone out throughout the department itself uh, that the officers understand. Um, so we also have our traffic safety teams, and within every precinct, the executive officer is responsible for the traffic safety program. So the message is out there with our officers, men and women out there. Thank you, and I thank the NYPD for curbing that practice. Uh, let's talk about bike lanes for a second because people parking in bike lanes is a huge problem, obviously, in New York City. Does the NYPD have the ability to clear bike lanes if civilian vehicles are parked in them? Yes, we do. Um, and um, during the course of the year, and uh, uh, we've issued uh, this year um, over 70,000 um, parking lane summonses to those individuals who are blocking uh, our bike lanes out there. And it's very important that we keep it clear so that the bicyclists are free, so that they don't have to um, put themselves in danger by going into the lanes of traffic when we have a specific lane for them. So we are doing enforcement in those areas. Uh, we the 70,000 this year, you said, correct? Yes, okay. 70,000 summonses, and I believe we're, um, for bike lane summons, we are increased that activity by over 6,000 for the year, which is a 9, 9.4% 9 increase. So that's an area we, we need to continue to work on. Um, we do have, um, uh, in July of this year, uh, we went about a three-week consecutive uh, uh, period when we continued to target that particular violation. That is a priority violation for our uh, traffic enforcement agents out there also to get vehicles that are blocking our bike lanes. And I want to move to something else because we've, we've got a lot of complaints and there's been no shortage of tweets to me and I'm sure to the other chairman about uh, police officers parking in bike lanes. Can you talk about what is the policy around uh, police officers parking in bike mm -hmm. lanes and is it okay to do that? Certainly, uh, we are obligated to follow the same rules out there. Uh, with the exception, uh, we would say, of emergency vehicles, if they are taking police action, uh, they respond to a location where they're going to a robbery or burglary in progress, I certainly uh, would take that as consideration that if they park their um, mock department car there. But other than being an actual police emergency, uh, there is no excuse for our officers to park there because it's convenient. Um, it's, it's not acceptable for them to do so. Uh, one of the areas that we um, spoke about at this, uh, about this particular subject is at our traffic staff meetings, and we also have members from other boroughs who attend. For example, if Manhattan is here today, uh, the message will be shared, uh, whatever lessons we learn, to all the boroughs in, in terms of what our, our, our policy is. Uh, the department has also issued uh, what we call a finest message, which is sent to every precinct and police facility that advises them that they are to, they're obligated to follow the, the rules of the road and not park in now bicycle lanes, bus lanes, and things of that nature. So again, uh, this is an ongoing effort, um, and we want to make sure that our officers are not uh, just leaving their vehicles in those locations. I want to turn your your attention to this video quick, and I don't want this to read as a gotcha moment because I know the challenges of um, finding parking in New York City and the challenges of officers, um, especially as tightly confined we are around uh, police precincts, how the challenges uh, really do um, increase uh, across the city. But I just want to point to this Twitter feed quick.
Thank you. So after reviewing that video, Chief, that this does not look like an emergency. In fact, it looks like the whole precinct agreed to park perpendicular to fit as many cars as possible. And this is from October 4th of this year. And I just wanted to get, what is your response to this? I, I think that um, what we mentioned before previously is that when we have individuals who do that, but then uh, what we see here is that there's a collective um, number of vehicles that are parked uh, and they are blocking the bike lane and therefore that's an issue for the the commander of that particular facility to make sure that those bike lanes are not blocked um, we have received complaints in certain locations and we address it on a timely basis we reach out to co commander and we hold them accountable so certainly we'll take the information at that location to make sure we follow up so that those vehicles are not blocking that bike lane so that the bicyclists can use it and this is not the only precinct mm -hmm. in New York City that does this. I know some of my colleagues, certainly from Queens, will speak about um, these same challenges. And once again, we don't want to read it. I don't want you to read this as a gotcha moment, but it's an opportunity for us to um, do the work similar to what Councilmember Menchaca did in his district, working with his, legal, uh, his local CO to ensure that the, the bike lanes were actually cleared. Are there any plans for DOT to work, with, uh, to work with you to address the issues for all precincts? And I know I'm gonna build a new precinct in Queens and we've sort of got ahead of it because I was really worried about um, the parking situation. Uh, so we found an opportunity that I hope will suffice to ensuring that we don't have similar situations that are arising with other local precincts. So can you just speak to what, is, what does coordination look like, um, you know, we don't want to um, add burdens onto our officers and having a circle a block 20 times, but there at least needs to be some more thoughtfulness put into parking around local precincts. And I'm just interested in hearing, is there any plan to look at all precincts in New York City to make sure that we can ensure bike lanes are cleared. Sure. And, and, and not just bike lanes, pedestrians being able to walk. So then I know for us, like I'm not gonna go into what my colleagues will speak about, but pedestrians have to walk in the streets in certain precincts in South Queens um, for this very reason, because there are cars parked on the sidewalks, so. Again, we, uh, we've worked very closely with our partners in the Department of Transportation, and when, when we survey and we identify locations, we will sit down, uh, specifically the command, with people from whether bor borough representatives from uh, the Department of Transportation to look at the area, identify possible new locations where we could resolve the situation. But again, our partners uh, uh, at the Department of Transportation has been working very closely with us on that. And, and I'll just add, a, a lot of you are very familiar with each of our borough commissioners who are the ones who I think work really hand in glove with local precincts. I, I think Mr. Chairman pointed out it's, it's, it's a challenging problem. We obviously are very keen to make sure that all city vehicles, not just police vehicles, are not parked in bike lanes, are not blocking pedestrian routes. Um, you know, and where we can, we look to see if we can help with that parking situation. Some parts of the city, you know, as you're saying, the new precinct, you have a chance to create parking, but in a lot of the precincts around the city, it can be a real challenge to accommodate the city vehicles, but it, I think it is a pretty constant dialogue between our two agents. So is there a comprehensive plan and working collectively to try to figure out how we can ensure every precinct I mean, is I adhering think you, to? You, you may recall the mayor announced last year it was part of a broader placard initiative that, you know, that was one of the things he particularly wanted to tackle for police precincts and fire departments, a holistic solution on parking, I would say we are still working through it because it's tough, but it has certainly come to us as a mayoral priority. Okay, and, uh, and what would be um, repercussions for participating in activity like that? Would an officer be ticketed or how does that work? Specifically, uh, whether precincts and facilities of that, we hold our commanding officers accountable for those areas um, in terms of the the, uh, the parking and the safety. We want to keep the, the fire hydrants clear, the crosswalks and, and the bike lanes clear for our, our bicyclists and our pedestrians to make sure that they can use it safely. Um, it's a 
constant uh, area that we harp on and also uh, we ask them to look at it very carefully. We talk to our executive staffs, the borough executives, to make sure that uh, their personnel in their borough are following the rules and regulations. Uh, but on occasions we ha do have situations where some people have and uh, those officers will be directed to move. Uh, they all can also so they're be, given a warning at least to move. Can be moved vehicle. or right, and, and ultimately, um, uh, the if uh, on the precinct block itself, and we have what we have we call station out security. They can walk the block itself just to make sure that we are in proper compliance. But as you mentioned before, on that that photo or that video there, uh, that's a situation that where the commanding officer has to address it. Okay, thank you. I'll go to my other colleagues for questions. Thank you, Chair. Now, let's go to the colleague, Council Member Ku, followed by Council Member Menchaca. Uh, thank you, Chair Rodriguez and Donovan. Uh, Commissioner Ch Chalamber and Chief, Tom, uh, Chief Chan, uh, despite all the job challenges, I want to thank you for your dedicated public service to, uh, to our city. Yeah. Um, uh, my question is, uh, I have two questions. Now, we all know that uh, bicycle uh, traffic is going to be increase a lot more now. But not too many people talk about the pedestrian safety side. Now, when a bicycle hit a pedestrian, uh, and the pedestrian had to go to the hospital and incur a lot of medical expenses, uh, there's no way uh, he can get uh, paid by the by the uh, bicyclist who who uh, hurt the pedestrian. So have you ever thought about the idea of having a uh, registering all bicycles and then make all bicycles they have a basic insurance in case they hit uh, somebody? Um, I'll, I'll I'll take a crack at that, Councilor Ku, and and thank you for your kind words. Um, you know, in this job, I hear a lot from, you know, as, as, Council, as Chairman Richards was saying, all, all different sides who sometimes feel there is a war amongst them between pedestrians, cyclists, and motorists. And we're talking a lot about cyclists' deaths today. But of course, we're concerned about all deaths on the roadways. Pedestrians actually tragically are, are dying in proportionately larger numbers than cyclists. And, and we worry about motor occupant vehicles as well. And certainly, I know pedestrians can often have the perception that cyclists are, you know, flouting the rules. I'm happy to say if you look at the actual numbers, it is certainly very rare for a collision between a pedestrian and a cyclist to result in a death. There are cases where they result in injuries. You know, we are, you know, one of the things we've proposed in this report that we think will help is what we're, you know, the title of the report is The Green Wave, but, but one of the initiatives is in quarters where we see heavy cycling traffic to retime the signals such that cyclists will get a, a green wave of lights. We're, we're really hoping and we're seeing with an experiment we, we've done in Borham Hill that that not only makes the ride better for cyclists, but it, it, in, it produces better compliance with red lights. Because cyclists are tempted if they've got momentum to go through red lights because it's hard to stop at every single red light. We're hoping we're going to be continuing to expand the signal timing program we're hoping that will help with compliance. It will reduce the general feelings of conflict between cyclists and pedestrians, because obviously we want everybody to feel comfortable and safe on our streets. I do think we see, though, that if you look at the statistics, luckily there are not a lot of terrible collisions between cyclists and pedestrians. And you know the ideas have been floated for should there be more registration. So it doesn't seem a feasible thing. Children start cycling at a young age. That's what we'd like to encourage. I know of only one jurisdiction that's ever looked at that. I think San Francisco did and, and decided it was a, not a feasible experiment. But I, I think both agencies are very committed, particularly to working with the cycling committee groups like Bike New York, to do everything we can to work with the cycling community and to design our roadways in such a way that we're encouraging safety from, from all the yeah, users but, and reducing but, those but conflicts. Commissioner, my, my question is, that how do we, Im, we, even though it doesn't happen that much, right, but how do we, Im, we reimburse the pedestrian if the bicyclist uh, doesn't have insurance to pay for uh, his or her damage? Well, let me, I think PD the, the, can, the, can I'm talking about, about the financial the, side, not, not the, how many times it happened, no? 
Well, I think PD can. I mean, you, you can incur a lot, a lot of damages on, too. They are on the ground for some of those. So that's why I asked you that um, why don't we make all the bicyclists buy a basic insurance in case they, they hurt somebody? I mean, I, you know, I think bicyclists still have. A bicyclist who's injured on the ground still has legal action that they can institute a, a lawsuit against the the pedestrian can introduce a lawsuit against the bicyclist. Um, I mean, and you're right. There's no insurance program um, for it the way it is for cars, and I don't know exactly what that would entail um, to make that happen. But but there is still remedy, a legal remedy for for a pedestrian injured by a bicyclist in in courts. All right, because I, well, I don't think we can solve, solve this now. Uh, Mr. Chair, I want to ask a second question. It's a very short question for Chief uh, Chen. So in my neighborhood, uh, a lot of immigrants, uh, they use bicycles, right? But they bicycle, when they park their bicycles, their bicycle gets stolen. And then uh, more than often, you turn up in another neighborhood to somebody selling the same bicycle. And uh, when, when they reported to the police station, the prison, the prison doesn't take this as a priority for them. No? So, so a lot of times, many people get their bicycles stolen two times, three times. Um, so I want to, you to ask your opinion to how do you make this a priority for local prisons to take uh, uh, stolen bicycles as a priority and make sure they enforce it. Um, make sure they go around the neighborhood and see who is selling uh, s stolen bicycles and where they are uh, stolen the bicycle from. There are certain spots in every neighborhood where uh, they, people, uh, their, their bicycles get stolen. Um, certainly, I, I would encourage uh, our bicyclists out there, and th this is a program that's readily available uh, by community fairs where uh, a group of officers will come out there and actually uh, etch um, identifying um, serial numbers and things of that nature and to register their bicycles into this particular program and thereby it goes into our database and therefore if the bicycle is recovered we are able to notify the uh, owner uh, and we are also able to hold the individual accountable for it. Um, any larceny, whether it be a, a bicycle, uh, whether it be a car, those are important to our citizens because that may be their means of transportation, it may be their means where they're going to utilize it for work and things of that nature. So it should be taken very seriously, but the identification and these programs are free. Uh, they can bring it and schedule it with their community affairs officer to have that information etched into their bicycles at their convenience and set up a, where they stop by the precinct. But what happens is that I encourage everybody to join that program, but certainly um, um, crimes that are where that the property uh, should be seriously dealt with uh, by our officers out there. And uh, again, it's very important that we take care of that because uh, the, again, these people, our citizens depend as a means of transportation. All righty, we're gonna go to Council Member Menchaca. Thank you, chairs, and uh, thank you both for being here today, uh, Commissioner. Trottenberg, I just want to say I'm sorry for your loss, and I know this is felt across the city, and every time someone dies on our streets uh, is felt by everyone, and so my condolences to you, the team, and the family. Um, thank you for uh, also just lifting up the work that we've done together, all three of us, uh, Council, NYPD, and DOT on LPIs. I'm, I think we're all looking at the data, and it's, it's just good, so it's just always important to talk a little bit about how a community effort, um, really with people on the ground, offered an opportunity to change the law, and it happened uh, in the name of safety. Uh, intro 769, and this is maybe for the NYPD solely, really kind of offers an opportunity for engagement that I think is positive, and this is another idea that came from uh, bicycle riders in terms of how they would like positive interactions with the NYPD. And part of that is so that the summons and the canceling of that summons happens at the police precinct. Uh, and one of the ideas that just came from Twitter uh, in the bike hive mind, is, if, if, you, if you will, uh, is not only doing intro uh, 769 that allows for a 48-hour 40, 
uh, response from the person getting the summons to fix the equipment issue, but to allow for and uh, encourage equipment giveaways as part of that relationship building with community and NYPD. And the last thing I want to say is that the work that we're doing on the, in, the sunset, in Sunset Park, really I think in the catalyst, is a catalyst, and the, uh, the new bike lane has really offered an opportunity for discussions between the school and the precinct uh, at the 72nd. Incredible leadership on all sides in the community. The convening that's been happening at the station, and Deputy Inspector Gonzalez has been incredible at understanding, listening, taking appropriate action, and doing that within a quick timeline. And I think that should be praised. That's happening there, and everyone's taking notice of it, which is why it's a question in this conversation. And that's about relationships. We don't get anywhere without relationships, and so this is really in the spirit of that. So I guess on intro 769, do you have the power right now to cancel summons of this kind, bike, uh, bike equipment summons? Is that in your power today? So, so I think we c there are times in sort of in the immediate aftermath where we could do it, but uh, when it's improperly prepared um, or shouldn't have been given at all, we could do it. Um, but today, today, right but at some point, it goes off to the the tribunal, um, right? And then we don't have that ability anymore. So right, which is why we're we're asking for the forty eight. And, and really, you're currently doing it right now for vehicles, I understand. Right, so for taillights, we currently will do it, but, what, but that's the same, uh, same structure where you come in, you show, you fix your taillight, and we give you a form, and then you go to the Traffic Violations Bureau and show it to the form, and then you show it to that court who can then dismiss the case. So that's the, the structure that happens, as I understand it right now. Okay, so uh, my time is up, but it sounds like we're aligned here. Uh, and I, so I'm trying, trying to figure out exactly what's happening in terms of the issue with, with this bill. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we can get to a, a good place. We can work on it. I, I, okay. you know, the, the, the goal we support, you know, the idea is to promote safety. And if you're fixing the, the issue with the bike that promotes safety, we're on board with that. So in the, the mechanism we can work on on how to actually do that. Okay, I'm looking forward to doing that uh, swiftly. Councilmember Deutsch, followed by Deutsch, Miller, Cabrera, Holden. Thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon. Good morning. Um, so I, I have been a motorist and a car owner for more than 30 years, and um, I just gave up my car, my personal car, uh, a few months ago. So now I'm a proud transit rider, and um, and I encourage those who, who own cars. I come from a district where everyone relies on vehicles. And I go to my meetings, I go to my civic meetings. I had a, a meeting yesterday in uh, a, a block meeting. And I encourage people that if they can, leave your car at home at least once a week and use mass transit. And this way we could take vehicles and cars off the street. Now, we have seen a, a uptick of um, cyclist um, crashes uh, and fatalities. Now, do you believe that we should encourage cyclists um, just as we encourage motorists to take mass transit, that they should get off the bikes and use mass transit? No, <laughs> I guess I'll just say in a nutshell, I think one of our guiding principles in the transportation system of New York City is you know, we want to encourage people to use the most sustainable modes. Walking and biking are the most sustainable modes. Certainly transit is more sustainable than using a car, and we applaud you, council member, for um, using mass transit more. You know, we have a, a principle that we believe holds true, despite the tragedies we're seeing this year, that there's safety in numbers in cycling. That the more cyclists that are out on the roadways, the more drivers become accustomed to seeing them and looking for them and remembering, I don't open my door without checking whether there's a cyclist coming. That builds more support for safe cycling infrastructure. So I, I don't want to encourage anyone to, to get off a bike, but certainly in the, the hierarchy of, of transportation in New York City, everyone who gets out of a car and is walking, biking, or taking mass transit better for the transportation system, better for the environment, and more safety. I appreciate that answer. 
Um, so my question is on the green on the green wave plan. Um, I represent uh, Southern Brooklyn. So I have seen plans from DOT um, uh, on Emmons Avenue to have protected bike lanes. I happen to live on a bike lane which is totally unprotected. Uh, and uh, I have not seen any type of outreach how motorists should open a vehicle so they shouldn't uh, have a bicyclist uh, ram into their door. So I always tell people to open with your right arm so this way you're forced to look into the, to, into the side view mirror. But we have uh, 2.5 miles of Coney Island boardwalk uh, where it's totally protected and bikes are restricted from riding on the boardwalk. If we could add a bike lane uh, going across to add that in the green wave, uh, then you're taking, um, you're putting bike um, cyclists in a protected uh, area where there's no vehicles. And secondly, about five years ago, I had the commissioner come into my district on Shaw Boulevard where we were able to implement a protected bike lane going from Emmons Avenue to Kingsborough College, which would totally be on a sidewalk, which there was enough room that's owned by Parks Department where they agreed to have a bike lane uh, on that in that area. You're not taking any space away from pedestrians or anyone else. And it's five years later and nothing has been done. That plan has not been implemented or even spoken about uh, since then. Uh, on another note, we had the SBS on Kings Highway, which was implemented more than a year ago. And I had seven site visits there with all your agency, with traffic department, with everyone. We're still not done. We're still not done. And I just sent you an email yesterday, and that is also um, regarding the SBS bus lane. The bus lane has signage that says buses only. But when I look on the website, when it doesn't have a time, it's 24-7. How are people supposed to know it's 24-7 unless they go on the DOT website? There's no way to know. And if you have tourists coming in using the Kings Highway bus lane, there's no way for them to know. It's a money grabber and people are getting summonses um, up until 10 o'clock, 10 p.m. When I look at Broadway, right here in front of City Hall, it's 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. The only other areas I was able to find yesterday was 1st and 2nd Avenue. So can you tell me that Kings Highway is more busier than Broadway after 7 p.m.? So there's, there's a bunch of questions in there. Let me attempt to run through them, and I'm, I'm going to have Eric jump in, too. And Look, happy to continue. You and I have had a, a many years of dialogue about the bike lanes and the sort of the cost and complexities of, of putting them in that park, uh, you know, the park's location, but we happy to continue that discussion. Um, I didn't, I'm, I apologize, I didn't see your email yesterday. It's not been an easy week for a bunch of reasons, but we have your request on the bus lane. And look, I think you make a point, council member. I, I, I would take some liberty to share it with your colleagues. There's been a lot of fine tuning on King's Highway. It has been a very iterative process. It is fair for you to say there's still more work to do. Just as we balance the council's desire for us to move faster and faster on projects, I just want you all to remember then it, it takes a lot of time and refinement sometimes to get the designs right. And you know, we don't want to shortchange the implementation process and sometimes we go back and forth for many months and we're always ready and willing to do that and we have your new request on the hours. We'll take a look. I will just, and, and there are other places where we have 24 hour bus lanes. The, the 24 hour bus lanes can often serve a dual purpose, just so you know, which is to keep the buses moving but also often on stretches of roadway where at night the roadway is very wide and we've seen high crashes and we've seen injuries and fatalities. So there are places where we wanna keep that bus lane to, to calm the road, to, to make, sort of put it on a, a late night road diet. Now in this case, we'll, we'll take a look, we'll check the signage, we'll come back and work with you all on it. But there can sometimes be a dual purpose to why we want a bus lane to be. I, I understand that, but let me tell you something. Um, Chief Chan, working with your office has been a total disaster. Um, when Kings Highway Nostrand, after DOT implemented that, we, we've seen crashes going up. I pulled out every police report from three different precincts who share that intersection. And when I asked your office for a traffic agent until DOT gets it right, the response was that it's too dangerous for a traffic control officer to direct traffic in that intersection. But it's not dangerous for a cyclist, 
It's not dangerous for pedestrian. It's not dangerous for motorists. And we need to get enforcement where it's needed. On Kings Highway, we have 19 spots for truck loading and unloading. And vehicles park in those truck loading and unloading spots, right? Enforcement is not enough. We need to do something more. And we had a site visit there, Commissioner. And just to issue a summons for a vehicle parking in a spot that trucks are supposed to be parked there, and then you still have the same problem. Trucks are still double and sometimes even triple parking. We need to get to the, to the underlying issue and get to the root of the problem so this way our buses run smoother. And this has been going on over a year. And I could just tell the panel here, and Rebecca has been very responsive all the time, but I just want to tell the panel that at the next hearing that I come here, I'm going to come with a blow horn. And when I hear this testimony of we want to reduce fatalities, we want to reduce crashes, I'm going to have that blow horn set off in the mic until I get thrown out of here. Because we need to work together, agencies need to partner together when it comes to enforcement, when it comes, when it comes to making our roads safer, when it comes to making our buses run smoother for all commuters and to keep our cyclists safe. And I don't see any education, any outreach of anyone handing out flyers Please be aware of cyclists. We have an increase, we have an influx of cyclists in our city, in Brooklyn. I don't see anything, nothing. Council Member, we'd be happy to, to partner with your office in terms of getting some education out there. We have it. A so let's get it done. Well, sure. Let's okay. get it done. Let's get Tova. Kings Highway done. Let's get enforcement out there. Because I'm telling you, it comes to a point when we, we had enough. You, and you, and, I, and you know my district. It's very difficult to convince my district to get certain bike lanes. I'm waiting for the Emmons Avenue Green Wave to be connected. And I spoke at meetings. And I spoke about this new thing that I, I, I want to support a protected bike lane. Right. And I spoke to the commissioner. We love hearing that. But, but now they're telling me it's pushed back. And when I speak to my civic meetings, they tell me, oh, we didn't hear about it. And I thought already there was engagement with my communities, with the civic, uh, uh, civic uh, 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 right. organizations. Councilman Deutsch, we want to wrap up. So we need to. Uh, so I, I, can I just say one thing? Once I get six minutes, I have two committees here. I'm on transportation and public <laughs> safety. So <laughs> that's, I, that's clever. It's wonderful news to hear that you gave up your car. I love that you want to do messaging about Doring, and we'd be happy to work with you. We've done social media messaging on that. We could give you messaging that you could push out on your own Twitter. We could come into your district with our safety education team. We're always happy to partner with you, and you know how to always find me, and so does Tova. So we're always working together. Thank you. I want to, I want to work with uh, Commissioner with you and with Chief Chan, and I want to get this done. Thank you. Thank you for your slickness, Councilman Deutsch. All right, we're going to go to Councilmember Miller, followed by Miller Cabrera, and then Holden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, education is crucially important, and we've had numerous uh, hearings here in transportation over the past five years that were very specific to cyclist safety, pedestrian safety, and so forth. Um, but we are here to talk about cyclists and, and roads, and, and I don't want to be insensitive, but certainly this council has demonstrated that we value cyclists, that we understand um, the vi the, how we have transitioned from uh, being motorists to cyclists and how to make our streets safer. But I will preface it that by saying that it has been kind of one-sided and, and, and saying so that there are uh, um, conversations that have not been had. Um, and I'm not, for one, who believes that the way that we get to cyclists, pedestrian, motorist safety, and particularly cyclist safety, is to get all the motorists and pedestrian off the road. Um, which seems to be the direction that, that we're going in. Um, so I do have a number of questions, and, and, and so I, I, I want to get through them. Number one, um, when we talk about uh, uh, the creation of the um, uh, secured bike lanes, in particular uh, F Fountain Avenue, um, what is the data that supports that we use to create those? Is it volume of cyclists? It is, is it um, potential uh, sites um, that, that folks need to get to and so forth? 
uh, because that is a, a, a very unusual place, location for that to pop up. And then, my, and, and then um, in terms of uh, what kind of data and surveying goes into it, because I turned down that street, happens to be in front of the junior high school that I attended, a truck was delivering in one lane and we sat there for 15 minutes. So uh, what goes into that in advance? And then um, as we holistically talk about uh, cyclist safety, something that we've been talking about, I have a bill that I introduced four years ago, which was helmets, and I know we all agree that helmets uh, as seatbelts reduce um, uh, major injuries and, and, and fatalities, but that has not occurred yet, and that is for 16 and under. I want to know if you and the NYPD are supportive of that, as well as no texting while, while cycling. Um, for Commissioner? Right, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll start with the bike lane question, and you know, one mm -hmm. we've discussed with this committee many times, and many of you individually, you know, it is, a, it is a sort of iterative process that we use to build out our bike network. And you can see, well, the, the poster was moved away there, but we can bring it back. Um, you know, we, we, on the one hand, have now put together a vision of, you all have, yes, if you all have your green waves, you can see it in there. There's a bunch of different maps. One is sort of where the city was 15 years ago in terms of bike infrastructure, where we are currently. One, and you can see, we've, a lot of it is built out from the core, connecting key destinations. We have a new focus on what we call the bicycle priority districts. Fountain Avenue in East New York is one of those, areas that are sort of tiers out from the center city, where we, I, I was riding on Fountain Avenue yesterday, there were a lot of people cycling there. Um, you know, where we start to see cycling activity occurring, where we look at the safety statistics, and where we certainly do want to connect to, to important destinations. As I mentioned in my testimony, the bike lane that we've put in on Fountain Avenue connects now to a beautiful new state park, Shirley Chisholm State Park, that connects to the Jamaica Greenway, so it is a nice neighbor, and, and it connects to a bunch of other routes and destinations in the neighborhood. You know, there had been a criticism that in some ways our bike network can be piecemeal, and sometimes that can be true in that a community will come and have a particular corridor that they want to see a bike lane on. Our goal over time, and, and you can see the details of it starting to flesh out on this map, is to connect all those corridors together, but I don't want to discourage a community that wants to see a particular bike lane if it isn't yet ready to be connected all the way into, into lower Manhattan, for example. So that kind of speaks to community engagement, community board five and the rest of that stuff there. How much will they engage? And are we prioritizing cyclists as a tourist attraction or, uh, or as recreation as opposed to the everyday day-to-day -day functions of a community, including education, including economic development, and the rest of that stuff there, whereas we have total gridlock for 15, 20 minutes because of design, poor design, or, or lack thereof. Um, what goes into that? I don't want to spend too much time on that, but I also want, because I want to speak to some of the other things that I talked about, which was helmet safety and the other thing. Then I, want, I also wanted to get to Chief Chang and talk about investigations of these accidents, what goes in post-investigations. Do we look at beyond summonsing? Um, uh, we're looking at infrastructure, we're looking at signage, the lack thereof, and the other things that are going on. And then finally, um, the piggyback on Council Member Deutsch, and, and he's talking about education. This is a whole paradigm shift of, of I'm born and raised here and have, have cycled my entire life, including Fountain Avenue in East New York. And this is a new paradigm for everybody, right? And, and there's an assumption that folks get this, but there are communities like Fountain Avenue, like Southeast Queens, like that, that this, is, this is new. Right? And then when we come out and we start talking about the right of way and people being punished for right of way and other laws and regulations that have come to being over the past few years, how do we educate folks to this? Is this a part of the New York State's driver's manual? Is this the law? Particularly, how many people actually know what an LPI is? I survey folks all the time, and including members. How many people in this room outside the cycle community know what the LPI is and, and its impact on potential impact on pedestrians and, and motorists as, as well as cyclists? And so we have a lot of work to do. We're assuming in this room, in this world, that 
that we all get it, right? But once we step outside of here, we have about 8 million folks that have no idea what we're doing here, and, and, and that will continue to perpetuate the, the, the unsafe conditions that we see. Are we doing enough to make sure that our cycling, our motorists, and our pedestrian community is, is safe? And, and, bef and before we go, we had this conversation when we were talking about permits uh, um, that were issued in, in the city, and I get trolled on, and I know you get the same thing on Twitter about my local precinct, and they are parking not only in the no standards on the street, but on the sidewalks, and they are forcing not only cyclists, but pedestrians into the street and causing congestion, where we have two municipal parking lots that are no less than 20 feet away from the precinct. So I, I'd like to, to tackle just a couple of the things you said, Councilmember Miller, and I just want to make it clear, I don't assume that everyone in the city knows what we're doing, and it's part of why when we talk about, for example, the Fountain Avenue lane, I was very proud yesterday to stand with a bunch of the groups we have worked with at the local community level, and we have been on the ground in East New York and Bed-Stuy for several years. Who are they? Uh, bed Restoration Corporation. In, in Girls, East New York. bed Restoration Corporation, and they have a woman who runs the East New York Jobs Program. We've worked with the NYCHA project there. So we've, look, I'm not going to pretend that Cypress everyone. Hills. Hmm? Cypress Hills? Hmm? Cypress Hills, NYCHA? Yeah, the, Cypress the, Hills. The, yeah. the, the, the uh, Tenants Association there? Uh, I don't know the name of the person we work with, but we worked with, the, again, someone at Cypress Hills, someone from who handles particularly East New York jobs in the bed Restoration Corporation. So I, I think our agency, we want to take the time to work closely on the ground. And I agree with you. A lot of people don't know what an LPI is. On the other hand, if you say to them, do you like getting a head start when you cross the street, I find that resonates with most folks. And I want to just, if you look on page three of the Green Wave, you're sort of talking about whether these are tourist areas we're focusing on, I sort of want to reassure you, these pink areas are the areas we particularly want to make progress in. They are neighborhoods we are seeing a lot of cycling. It's not, it's not mostly not tourists, it's local residents, and we really want to make sure we can build, there are places, unfortunately, where we've seen a lot of fatalities, and we want to build out that cycling infrastructure. And I agree with you, we need to do a lot of work on the ground with local communities. There are places where you know, they don't necessarily like city government too much, but we're committed to that effort. We don't go into communities assuming everybody knows and loves what we're proposing. We know we have to do our homework. We certainly welcome working with you all on the council to help us. With all due respect, I, I, I spoke to the Tenants Association president at Cypress Hills. I also talked to, talked to the president and district manager, Community Board 5, and you guys didn't engage them. Well, I, I have to disagree. We've been on the ground there but for what's, quite a while. What's the name of the, what, what's the, name of the person at, at, at uh, Cypress Hills that you talk to? All right. And who's well, their I, community board president? I will, I will grab you the names of those things and follow up, but I, I have to say I stood with a big group of pretty enthusiastic people and, yesterday. And, 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 and in terms of design, is, is it appropriate that traffic gets backed up when the school makes a delivery nearly every day? that so, you lose an entire lane, the so only lane going southbound? If there are particular spots where we're seeing those problems, then get them to our offices and we'll do tweaks. We often find when we put in, and one of the questions that was raised about the bike lane yesterday was there were still some cars parking in it because we'd created a parking protected bike lane, but cars didn't know yet that we had added those parking spaces. So as we're saying here today, there's often a process where we have to make a lot of adjustments. But do you take into consideration delivery on, on to, to schools? We do, and in fact, we, we worked pretty closely with those schools. And I want to just point out about East New York you know, this is a hearing on cyclist fatalities. This is a neighborhood where we've seen cyclist fatalities. And I think one thing we all know works, one thing I think most people in this room would agree, is that protected bike lanes are the best solution we have for cyclist fatalities. Do, do, do you support helmets? Um, you know, the, when we announced our green wave, we, we announced that we would be, that DOT would be greatly increasing. We do a lot, we work with a lot of you, we do a lot do of- Do you support helmet legislation? Let me, if you could just let me finish, council member. We agreed we would continue to do our cyclist giveaways and particularly work with city bike and other cycling groups to give helmets. Children 14 and under are required to wear helmets in New York City, but there is a creative tension of in cities where 
having adults required to wear cycling helmets, cycling goes down, particularly for Do things like city Does bikes. DOT support it, yes or no? I mean, DOT supports people wearing helmets. We don't support making it mandatory. Do you support no texting while cycling? I support no texting while cycling or driving, for sure. But because not, those, those people. But I, I don't. I don't have, know that I would want to have. Have died in this, I don't know in that this I, committee. I don't know that I would want to have NYPD in the business of infor of having an enforceable offense against cyclists there. But I'll let them speak to that. Please do. So I mean, sitting right here now, I have not read. The, the bills in a long time, but I think we would agree texting while cycling is something that should be prohibited in, uh, in terms of the, the helmets. Um, you know, we think we, we agree with DOT that should be very, very much encouraged, um, but you know, we'll have to review the legislation more on, on, on that one to see what we, where we come up on it. Thank you, Councilmember Miller. Uh, Fernando Cabrera, followed by Cabrera Holden. Do I get 10 minutes now? <laughs> uh, Commissioner, it's good to see you, uh, and Chief, and, uh, and all the staff. First, uh, Commissioner, I want to thank you, uh, and I want to voice uh, publicly for coming to my district, and just about every project that we talked about, uh, it is done, and which is going to help cyclists, it's going to help uh, drivers, uh, uh, the people in our community are, are extremely happy. Uh, they're pleased, uh, and they they send you their gratitude. So I want to thank you for that, and thank you uh, for putting feet uh, to every word that uh, you spoke. Um, I, I have a question that I think everybody wants to know, and I, I'm just like burning with curiosity. I know we closed down uh, 14th Street to drivers, right, correct? Is that correct? Well, we've turned it into a transit and truck priority route. So just to be clear, we're prioritizing the movement of buses and trucks. Local pickups and drop-offs are allowed. So it is it, contrary to what you might have, it's not entirely closed off to vehicles. We're just discouraging cars using it as a through route all the way across town. So are there any other avenue, street that uh, you're thinking of closing? And the question that I, I keep being asked is, it, is, are we looking to follow the model that we have in London, where pretty much you have whole sections where cars are not allowed to go through? So, you know, I think we just rolled 14th Street out a few weeks ago, and, you know, I think as a lot of you know, it was a long process with the L train, and, you know, I think with the initial results, we're very, very pleased. We're seeing the buses are moving a lot faster, ridership is up, we're seeing local businesses are able to get their deliveries and their customers, and we're not seeing terrible increases in traffic on the side streets. Now, we, we've had our partners from NYPD have been on the ground enforcing their, their slowly uh, reducing the amount of enforcement and, and directing of traffic they need to do. But I think, you know, the, the early results are, are very, very encouraging. And, and, of course, the speaker has said he declared it a miracle and he wants to see it potentially on other routes. There are a bunch of routes around the city where we could look to do variations of this treatment. Again, I would, I would say to the committee members, it was a long process of designing 14th Street and getting it right. And... You know, I think the kind of routes we would potentially look for are ones where, and I can think of ones in every borough, um, where we see very high bus ridership and, you know, we think we can do a design where, again, local businesses and buildings can still get what they need. We're not going to see big traffic impacts on enjoying street. But as I've said before, I think 14th Street is a promising template. I would certainly invite all members, if they had roots they wanted to discuss, we, we would love to do so. Okay, thank you. Uh, and just two questions, uh, Chief. Uh, one is actually, I need your help. I know we spoke back in June. Bailey Avenue, are having those Mack trucks parking there. It's everyday occurrence. I have one there, it's been there for four days. Uh, I ask you to get them tow away, put the boot on them, do something. We've written, we have not seen any action. I, we truly, we, we need action because then it complicates parking 
uh, for the drivers, and then that compounds all of the other issues that we're dealing around in the area. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, and maybe uh, with your t stats person, how many of those bike lane summonses uh, were actually dismissed? Um, we don't have that data in reference to the number of dismissals and things. Can you start working on that data? Because, uh, you know, I chair government operations and I deal with oath, uh, and that question is going to come up uh, in the near future in one of the hearings. So if you could start uh, working that. That may uh, very well be Department of Finance, but we'll, we'll look into that. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Chair, I turn it back to you, and I did not take 10 minutes. Thank you so much for both of the chairs. Councilman Beholden. Thank you, Chair. Um, and, and thank you, Commissioner, for supporting intro 1354. Uh, the cement mixers obviously are um, creating problems throughout the city for several years now. And just coming here, I was actually in my car in the BQE. Um, and you can see spillage all along the side and actually in front of uh, catch basins. Then, then you get ponding in the, uh, on the highway, and that's a danger to everyone. But the, the spillage does affect um, cyclists, pedestrians, and motorists. And I assume that your agency removes the, um, the spillage? You know, I'll, I'll say, Council Member, we identified this problem a few years ago ourselves, and I'll, I'll confess we've had ad hoc efforts to chip away at it, um, you know, and obviously when we resurface streets, we, we try and fix it, but that's why we really are such strong supporters of your bill. It, it is something where it, it's happening all over the city. We're trying to keep on top of it, but if we could nip the problem at the source, it would, it would make it tremendously easier in terms of agency operations, because it's, it's complicated and labor intensive to get the concrete off the streets. Yeah, I, I witnessed uh, they had to use a jackhammer, uh, especially exactly. any, any place where there's an incline, you'll see it. Even on slight inclines uh, on, on expressways, you'll see the spillage because they're stop and go and they spill. And I've, I've been behind a cement mixer that had uh, significant spillage on Elliott Avenue. It was a, it was a large hill there. And no sooner did, your, did the crews remove the spillage that it was back again uh, the next day. It, it is a, yeah. it's a frustrating problem. And we, of course, see it particularly Williamsburg and areas where, where you see, have a lot of concrete plants. <clears throat> we see it on the streets there. So you know, we thank you. We would love to try and address this problem. Oh, thank you. And uh, just a um, uh, note on the precinct um, blocking. Um, my precinct, I have a 104 precinct in Queens, uh, routinely routinely they're blocking not only the sidewalks in front of the precinct which is every day but more importantly we have crosswalks blocked hydrants blocked and i'm talking probably a dozen hydrants blocked around the area and that's not good for anyone i brought it to the attention of the commanding officer and, and to, i walked in the precinct i said this something has to be done here and it's it's gotten out of hand and why you know again the police are exempt I mean, th there's parking. You just have to probably walk four or five, six blocks, but you can find parking. Or there's a, there's a, a, a train station, a subway station right down the block um, that you could use. So we're, we're seeing um, a danger now in, in every neighborhood uh, that, are, that a precinct exists. Though I, I've called for a new precinct because obviously we've outgrown it, uh, in, in, at least in the 104 and in many precincts around the city. So we have really have to have a program, and I, and I think the mayor might want to lead on this, that we rebuild precincts or build them to, to 21st century standards rather than the early 20th century standards that we have today. Again, yeah, no, Councilman, thank you for bringing it to our attention. And I appreciate you reaching out to the commanding officer. And uh, again, it's something that he needs to address. So I'll just uh, have a conversation with him also in reference to that issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. I think we got through the list. I'll just end with two questions. Chief Chan, I'm going to go to the hard one first. Um, what is the department's protocol for providing information to the press in response to a collision? So we've obviously heard in some cases of leaks to the press, mm -hmm. blaming cyclists. Um, is that something the NYPD press office should handle um, prior to an investigation, or has there been any conversations 
um, within your department to make sure that those leaks are minimized? Um, one of the areas, we certainly have met with um, the transportation alternative and other advocates in reference to that issue, and their perception is that possibly officers are uh, maybe sharing information and things of that nature. Uh, our official uh, status is that we will funnel information through our uh, Deputy Commissioner of Public Information Office. That's where we give a consistent and a, um, we uh, will get it from the correct source to make sure that the information is correct. Um, unfortunately, uh, on occasions, we may get situations where people are simply at a location of a, a, a collision and uh, they overhear conversations and it does not necessarily mean that's the official version of what happens. So misinformation does get out there. But again, we uh, make sure that, and we've mentioned at, at traffic stat itself, uh, where we have the borough, we have the traffic safety teams and the individuals, the XO and, and the traffic teams, they're there. And we've, uh, again, uh, we've directed them to make sure that the proper uh, channels where the information is given to the public in reference to whatever type of investigation. Because quite often, whether it be a criminal or a traffic investigation, things do change uh, uh, and the uh, circumstances uh, we get additional information, we might see a video that may change uh, the course of the investigation. And uh, ultimately, we have been working with our advocates. Uh, they are helping us develop a, a um, um, uh, dialogue, and this will be something that will be shared with all our patrol officers out there. Again, just to reiterate that, to make sure that we're getting out the proper information, because uh, again, it doesn't help us uh, to have mis misinformation out there in reference to what occurred at that location. Right. Thank you so much, and I think that just goes back into the conversation. I think I started around victim blaming and ensuring that the correct information is getting out there uh, prior to an investigation being completed. Um, just want to go last thing. So you, you spoke of some good things. You spoke of expanding the three-week program um, uh, to the rest of the year. Can you just speak to the successes there? Uh, over the course of the last three weeks of that program, uh, do you think that uh, it improved safety? You know, how did you measure that? Um, but if this is being extended to the end of the year, clearly mm -hmm. you're seeing something, uh, su some success there. So I just want to hear a little bit more as I close sure. out on um, uh, why. That uh, initial with, this, uh, with the July initiative where we targeted um, parking and moving violations. You know, in other words, uh, we issued um, 14, over 1,400 summonses moving violations for people who are also driving into the bike lanes itself. So that violation, and that, um, that um, increased by 235% for that particular violation. What we did, uh, when we took a look at what was happening throughout the city, we have met with our borough commanders, our borough executive officers who oversee the specific traffic safety programs, and in light of uh, what was happening throughout the city, um, we decided and, uh, to implement multiple initiatives that occurred in the month of September. Uh, unfortunately, um, last year, uh, in, during the month of September, we had a total of 24 fatals that occurred last year. And that's a lot of fatals that occurred. And we said, what can we do uh, in, in junction to increase bicycle safety, increase public um, uh, pedestrian safety? And we had meetings, and we made decisions that we would have additional initiatives, initiatives which include bicycle safety initiatives, pedestrian safety initiative where we would target a right away. And we also see that speed is certainly a major factor in all our collisions in terms of the extent of the injury and also causing fatalities. So we targeted speed enforcement and during that time period in the month of September, um, uh, we went after a DWI on the Labor Day weekend. Um, we had motorcycle enforcement, bike safety uh, initiative, uh, pedestrian safety. Uh, we also targeted uh, aggressive driving and speeding uh, on three uh, specific weekends over that time period. When we take a look at the month of September uh, for a 28-day period, pretty much covering the whole month itself, our collisions decreased by 12%. Our injuries collisions decreased by 5%. Overall injuries decreased by 9%. Occupant injuries decreased by 8%. Pedestrian injuries decreased by 11%. Bicycle injuries decreased by 13%. Uh, our fatalities um, from 16 to 24, minus 8, down 33% for that time frame. So 
we targeted specifically what do we do different. We've done hazardous violations, which I've talked about many times, speeding, red lights right away, disobey signs, uh, improper turns, and also cell phone and things. Those are very important. But specifically, I asked our officers out there, let's go out there and do speeding summonses, because speed is always a factor. Um, but speeding in general and in conjunction, this was when the children were going back to school, we have our speed cameras also, and that's out there. Um, when we, we took a look at for the right of way enforcement, and again, um, we increased that dramatically, and year to date right now, we are up 36% in terms of right of way enforcement. But for that time frame, um, pulling back the, uh, the activity um, for our officers out there, um, right of way summonses year to date, uh, we are up 36%, over 15, close to 16,000 more summonses for that specific violation. And why that violation? Our pedestrians and our bicyclists, a car and a car has a collision. New cars have airbags, seat belts. Okay. Uh, but what happens is a pedestrian and a bicyclist, when they're struck by a car, they don't have those protections. They are more vulnerable. More injuries also means the increased likelihood, depending how they fall or struck, may be another fatality. So we've increased that particular violation. We're targeting that violation. We've asked our traffic safety team and our patrol officers to, to target that. But it is more labor intensive because what happened is that they have to uh, sometimes perform stationary enforcement at that location and actually watch the vehicles as opposed to uh, coming into contact with the motorist while they're driving. So what happened is that we targeted that particular enforcement we increased, the, and we saw during the months of September, there are days and weeks where we had an increase of 200% enforcement. Uh, in other words, um, let me just pull that out very quickly. Uh, where a time frame. Uh, I have one where. Okay, so going back even uh, last week, in terms of our um, uh, right-of-way summonses for the citywide, uh, there were 2,271 summonses issued for the right-of-way, compared to 955, which is actually 1,316 more, 137 percent more than we did during that week last year. And for the month, we're up um, 4,164, 97 percent. We're targeting that violation. I think with the return. On that particular violation, it protects our pedestrians and our bicyclists out there because they are the most vulnerable users on the road. And I think that um, we are going to continue that process uh, throughout the end to the end of the year, and um, more than likely that, that we will do so during the course of 2020. Thank you. And uh, is there a way for communities to actually uh, request enforcement in specific areas where they? Uh, feel that it's problemsome? One of the things, and a part of our, our traffic safety programs is that our precincts are looking exactly where the collisions are occurring for our pedestrians and also for our bicyclists. And I've, I've expressed to them, I said, while well, we have collision prone locations, but let's not wait until we have a, uh, three collisions, two collisions. If we have a collision there involving a pedestrian or a bicyclist, we should do enforcement at those locations. And if uh, the officers can actually um, observe vehicles, because we've said vehicles making left turns are three times as likely to cause an injury or fatality. But we also see that we have injuries and fatalities on right turns. But I certainly encourage them at traffic stat, and, and I bring that message to them. And we look at what they do, how their traffic program is. If they have collisions, show me the summonses that were issued. If you can't do it at a location because somehow geographically you can't do enforcement, then what about the corridor? What about the next block? What about the adjacent street? So we should see corresponding enforcement where, this, uh, where people are injured. And we see that this year, um, it shows one third of our collisions involving pedestrians are basically where people fail to yield to uh, the individuals who are crossing. Well, I want to thank you both for the work that you've done. I look forward to continuing to work uh, with the chairman and, and all agencies. It's very clear that we need more bike infrastructure and for that to move much more rapidly uh, across our city and obviously with enforcement 
and education, I think that we can really get uh, to a place where we are shifting the culture uh, in this city. And DOT, we need more left turn signals. That's always an, a must and a need. Um, so I hope we would keep focusing there as well. So I want to thank you for the work that you are doing. We look forward to continued conversations on a real co comprehensive plan on how we work with precincts on parking. Uh, and I'm happy somewhat with the progress we're making on not victim blaming cyclists, but we still have a long way to go to make sure that everyone in New York City feels safe on our roadways. So I want to thank you for the work that you've done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, hey, Chair. I have a few more questions before you will go on and call for the members of the public. It, with the, with the number that you share, how many people from the 25 cases being charged? You say five, right? What is the number? Four. Four. It, what happened to the other 21? Are they still pending investigation? Or, or did the other didn't include reason or why to charge those drivers? Um, when we take a look at, uh, there are also uh, individuals who are subsequently uh, issued summonses uh, where the uh, for other violations that we observed out there. And I have a tally of approximately 30 summonses uh, for individuals uh, that involving those particular cases. And again, um, I don't have the actual number where they, the closure or the, uh, the closing of the cases, but there are other cases in there within that 25 are still actively also being investigated. But again, four arrests and 30 summonses that were issued to the motorists. Uh, for those particular well, cases. I, we know that on the, for, for the hit and run, it's like 20 something police officers dedicated for the collision squad unit. What is the numbers of, of, of men and women, the NYPD dedicated to investigate those, all those cases related to crashes? Um, this, the CIS uh, unit that we, um, uh, let me just pull that number. And you will figure out, you come out with a number, but for our experience that whatever number you have is not enough. And, 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 and of course, that's when it comes to the hit and run. And for me, I'm more advocating, asking for my role. As I say, even when we look yes on the hit and run, I always say that we need to double that number okay. because there's not enough uh, uh, resources right now. Uh, when we have a city, again, that 42 hit and run, most of them damages, but 4,000 ended with people being sent in critical condition, and the average one person dying every week. You know, that, yes, that particular sector is too big to only have around in the 20. I know it doesn't, it doesn't go more than 30, right? right. Um, and we have currently a um, um, combination of 23, 25 people who are currently in the CIS unit that are doing the investigations on that. In conjunction with that, um, uh, in terms of investigations year to date, um, we've conducted about 290 investigations so far. Um, I think we only have maybe 10 more than investigations than we did last year. But what happened is that in conjunction, one of the things that when we met with the advocates and we looked at it, um, currently our, um, what they call the ECT unit, evidence collection uh, unit, uh, assigned to in Manhattan North uh, is a unit that responds to leaving the scene collisions where there are, are injuries, injuries of the but, nature. But I, but I think, Chief, I, I feel that, I hope again, that City Hall we make as one of the top priority when it comes to legislation to get Albany to provide more support to the DA. Because what we know is that the penalty for a driver who is involved in a hit and run mm -hmm. get less penalty, or mo less penalty than a driver that is driving, in, driving drunk. So, and again, this is not all. I know that mm -hmm. we went through this process. We went through, I always say, like, I never forget, like one of my best friend lost his son, eh, Jobel Rivera in Moshulo Parkway. And I show here on the fax five, the driver few hours after, you could see fax five capture and parking his car 
putting his car in fire to get rid of all the evidence. And it took like two years and a half or three years to see Belkis Rivera, his mother, going through the whole process through the DA, the advocates supporting her, and all, all they got was a deal of two years. So this is not just you know, the lack in, the, in that particular case is the NYPD or the DA. This is about red tape that we have at a state level. And I feel that as we heard from all the five uh, DAs, they need more support. And I would like to see again City Hall making this as one of the top priority from the legislative team that go to Albany to get Albany to change the law so that the DA get more empowered and increase the penalty after those criminal drivers, in this case, who leave the scene. But again, I just put a comparison when it comes to, you know, I don't see that there's enough or we need more. I, I hope that we can double the unit. And, and that's, this is about budget. But my only concern is about when it comes to investigate all the collisions that involve, you know, injuries. How do you feel? And of course, the talking point will be we find what we have, but I think that we need more. I think that we need more resources. I don't feel that, yes, you know, like what we have today is enough. I think that, you know, and I, I'm happy to get partner, you know, from the advocate, from the family for century, from the DOT, from new the NYPD. We try to do the best we can, but we should not be here. Like, that was not in the movies. That was not written. That after we've been working so hard, here we are, entering November, with 25 cyclists being killed. And, and so that's, you know, my appeal is to see how we can, you know, address. I don't want to hear, we find, we have the resources, you know, we're making progress. This is about, you know, like, we need to protect cyclists. We need to protect pedestrians. And what we have seen is an increase of more individual riding bike, and we want to incentivize that to happen, but we need to do better. So, and with that, and with that it takes me to, again, to the two, three questions. One is, year to today, how many crashes resulted in cyclists being injured? And how do we compare that number to last year? Collisions in general? Yeah. Happened to so right now, year, year to date. Year to, to date, year to how date. many crashes resulted in cyclists being injured? Yeah, year to date, uh, we have 3,642, as opposed to last year where we had 3,641. We're actually up one collision over the same uh, period last year. Last year? What was the number last year? Uh, last year was 3,641. This year it's 3,642. By today? Yes, and we're up one. By October 20th, we're up one. Okay. Uh, and how does DOT and, and police department track injury data, statistic, and rate of vehicle collisions beyond those that resulted in injury or death? Can you repeat that question? Yeah. H how do you, the agency, uh, track injury and statistics? and rate of vehicle collisions beyond those that resulted in injury of death? All the information is included on the police accident reports, and that data gets entered into, obviously, databases that we utilize to, uh, to track the information. Okay, and have you seen, is, that, is there like a different numbers with the data when we look at that approach, or is the same one that you share with all the 3642 by today compared to 3641 last year? No, I mean, that is the police department's data source right there, our traffic stat reports. So that should be accurate information, yes. But the, the, only, the only difference that the, in the question that I ask you is about a, a crashes that resulted in cyclists being injured compared to my other question, which is about not necessarily being injured, but crashes that have been happening. Right, I understand you're saying, <clears throat> you're saying how many, Collisions have there been involving bicyclists versus those where the bicyclist was injured. Uh -huh. And this does not break that out. So we're assuming that the bicyclists were injured. 
Okay. And but the do, do you also collect the do you also collect the data or the other universe of those who are not injured that yes, crashes that happen, collision that happen? I think we can get back to you on that. I mean, right now I'm not aware of it, but we okay. can, we can certainly get back to you on that. And and do you collect do you your organ? Can we get those data per precinct? From the pre from the precincts? Yeah, no, not from the precinct, but do you have the data in a way that if the council member would like to see how those data is break down? Yes, in his precinct, you the, can share that. The with routine us. information that we see. On this traffic stat report is available online, and you can actually see uh, a lot of the information, the summonses, uh, the injuries, and a lot of the information that I cited is actually by precinct. So they can actually look at those. They're not broken by by council districts, but it is broken by down by individual precincts. So that is available online. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. So with that, uh, thank you for you know being here with us. Uh, we have the same goals and responsibility to make the city safer for everyone. Now we're going to be calling the next panel. Gonna call uh, Amanda Hannah McLean, Families for Safe Streets, Lauren Pine, Family for Safe Streets, Mirza Mulberg, Family for Safe Street, Marcos Corner, Transportation Alternative, and Eric McClure from a Street Block Park. Again. Hello, uh, my name is Amanda Hannah McClear. Um, I have to be honest, when I start this, I just, when I was writing this yesterday, I considered not coming um, because it's extremely painful to rehash these traumatic events. Um, and because six cyclists have been killed since we lost Jose, and that's really hard to contend with. I'll start by saying that. On June 7th of 1994, my grandmother, Donna Blanchard, and my four-year-old aunt, Michelle Blanchard, were killed in a hit and run. They were pedestrians. They were just going to get breakfast. Um, the driver was never found. Uh, my dad still struggles every day to get out of bed because on that day in June, he was shaken awake by his friend and told that his mother and sister weren't coming home. And like I said, to this day, has a hard time getting up. And now, 25 years later, I also awoke to horrible news. I was at my partner's house, and we were celebrating Eid with his family. We watched some home videos, and I fell into a midday nap. And when I woke up, I was tentatively approached by my partner, and he told me that Jose Alzariz, my mother's partner, had died. It was surely a nightmare that I thought I was going to wake up from, but I never did. Um, I have to stress that we never worried about Jose cycling in the city because he took all of the necessary precautions. He was the safest cyclist you would ever meet. He found out that my, that my mom and I weren't wearing helmets and immediately went out and bought us helmets. Uh, I've been cycling on the streets since I was 14 without a helmet and we just never did it, um, but he made sure we got them. Um, and on August 11th of this past year, he had a helmet. He was waiting patiently for the light 
but a reckless driver was going 60 miles per hour in a 25 mile per hour uh, zone. So when the driver blew past that red light, a solid red on Coney Island Avenue, and he hit another car, that car went flying and killed Jose. If Jose wasn't following the rules of the road, he might have survived. But this can't be a city in which following the rules of the road gets you killed. I, I feel that we're a city that is playing catch up. We're playing catch up when it comes to pedestrian and cyclist safety. London implemented side guards five years ago. Where were we? We're supposed to be a leading metropolitan city. Cities like London, Paris, Oslo are blowing right past us. And I heard a lot about community engagement, and while that's important, the mayor of Oslo didn't second guess that she needs to shut down streets for pedestrian cyclist safety. She just did it. There was pushback from businesses, and she still did it anyway. And things are much safer there, and people are happier, and businesses did not suffer because of it. We should be talking about the implementation of a comprehensive network of 100% protected bike lanes. These bills should have been passed years ago. Like I said, London had passed it already. So yes, please pass these bills because they're past due, but we have so much more work to do. Uh, five years ago, they isolated Coney Island Avenue as a dangerous intersection, especially where, where, particularly where Jose was killed, and nothing was done about it, and we lost Jose. There should have been a protected bike lane there. And in the case of my grandmother and my aunt, it took about 20, 20 years until they narrowed the street because the boulevard was too wide. They knew that back then it took them 20 years to do it. We don't have time anymore. The only thing that keeps me coming up here and sharing the story is that Jose truly would have wanted me to because he followed crashes very closely in the city and they made him extremely angry. Just 12 days before he was killed, he shared an article with my mom about M. Smolovich the 30-year-old cyclist who was killed on 36th and 3rd in Sunset Park on July 29th. The crash happened right outside of my mom's office, and Jose was nervous about her riding her electric scooter from their home in Park Slope to Industry City. There's no questioning what he would have said if he was here with us today. The green wave doesn't go far enough. And I don't want to hear things like we heard just now about being realistic. It's not what I want to hear from a city that's home to gleaming skyscrapers that were deemed unrealistic and unimaginable years before. We have so much potential. We failed Jose because he was vigilant and informed and he was still killed. And if anyone's thinking that Jose, Jose should have known better than to cycle on these streets, I ask you to question where that bias is coming from. Because it's stifling. Are we supposed to sit home on a beautiful Sunday? Are we supposed to are we not allowed to bike back home? Are we not allowed to go for a swim? That's all that Jose was trying to do on August 11th. And people say this isn't a cyclist city, but I beg to differ. There are cyclists here that makes it a cyclist city. And I just have to say that Jose didn't drive. He didn't have a license because he was too terrified at the sheer idea of hurting someone or the potential to hurt someone. So he just didn't drive. And frankly, the bills on the table wouldn't have saved Jose and that's hard to contend with, but they might have saved M. Samalovich, and they will absolutely save someone who is walking among us right now. There's an innocent person out on the street whose life depends on our actions here. And I, I hate to think that six more cyclists have, killed, have been killed since Jose died. It just, it's so alarming and frightening. My family is frozen in August. And as our grief thaws, the city around us is bewildering. This is a city without Jose, and that just doesn't make any sense. It is confusing to me to see New Yorkers huddled under their jackets, to see Halloween decorations adorning homes and storefronts, because in our minds, the trauma of August is still so fresh. And if it was fall, Jose would be cooking us a warm meal, probably a recipe he found in the New York Times, which he loved to read. If it was fall, he would be asking us to take a tour of Greenwood Cemetery with him, which was one of his favorite places in the city. But he's not here. And I have a mom that's struggling to make sense of losing her partner that she thought she would have for another 30 years, for 30 years. And I, I share these personal details because I don't know how else to elicit empathy. And that's empathy, not sympathy, because sympathy is well-meaning cards and empty promises. Empathy is action, and we're going to need a lot more of it if we're going to save lives. 
There are no strangers here. My suffering, my family's suffering is also everyone's suffering in the room. And it should compel us all to make changes in the city and quickly. And for our NYPD, who's no longer here, which I wish they were, I'm a granddaughter and a niece of two retired officers, meaning I'm their niece, I'm their granddaughter. And I'm skateboarding, cycling on these streets. I have been since I was 14 years old. Once these bills are passed, I, and this is a direct message to them, I need you to enforce them. When you see a cyclist on the street, any cyclist on the street, that's me, and you can't let this happen to my family a third time. We can't lose a third, uh, uh, you know, another person. And I just want them to know that I follow the rules of the road. I don't speed, and I'm not reckless, and neither was Jose. And I, I believe these were passed out, but there are photos of us that I would just love you to, to look at, because he was a very real person. This is not an abstraction in numbers. I just want to say so sorry for your loss and thank you for coming here. I know it's not easy sitting there, but I want you to know that we appreciate you coming down to testify today. And we're going to continue to do everything we can do in our power to make sure that although they are gone, that their legacies uh, live on. And you're totally correct. It's not just about sympathy. It's about empathy and action. And that's why we're here today. So we're hoping these small steps can be helpful in ensuring that we never have to sit here again. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Richard and uh, Chair Rodriguez for convening today's hearing and also for your leadership in addressing the unacceptable realities that Amanda uh, just described. Um, my name is Mark O'Connor. I'm co-deputy director at Transportation Alternatives, and I'm here to testify in support of all the bills heard at today's hearing. Um, this year has been tragic, but it's important to remember that bicycling is a sustainable, healthy, and efficient mode of transportation that is vital if our city is ever to successfully address our chronic traffic congestion and reach our critical goals related to sustainability, carbon emissions reductions, health outcomes, mobility, and equitable access to jobs and education. As a city, we must enact policy that promotes biking and makes it safe and accessible. And bicyclist safety measures like protected bike lanes have the added benefit of substantially improving safety for pedestrians and motorists as well. Following five years with annual reductions in overall traffic fatalities, which is a testament to the efficacy of the mayor's Vision Zero program in the efforts of this council, it's critical that now as we face the first annual increase in overall traffic fatalities, that we double down on what has worked and continue on the path of addressing traffic violence systemically, always prioritizing safety. I want to speak briefly to some of today's bills which we strongly support. First, intro 769 to allow bicyclists to cure a ticket that they have received. Um, the purpose of enforcement must always be to deter potentially harmful behavior or omissions as opposed to penalization as a goal and purpose. By allowing cyclists to cure their violation and bring their bicycle into compliance, a higher level of safety is achieved. I also want to express our strong support for intro 1763 uh, to have a three-foot passing requirement for motorists when passing cyclists. In June of 2016, 36-year-old Dan Henekvi was killed riding a bike in Manhattan because a van driver deliberately decided to disregard the inadequate distance between his truck and Dan on a narrow street with parked cars. The driver honked with the horn of his van, even though there was nowhere for Dan to go. And then the driver sped past Dan, striking him with his van in doing so, killing a father and husband, all because the driver decided to not wait a couple of seconds until it was safe to pass. A three feet passing requirement sends a simple and clear message. If you are operating a multi-ton vehicle and you cannot pass a vulnerable road user ahead of you at a safe distance, then you must wait until it is safe to pass. 
Lastly, I want to express our support for truck side guards requirement. Side guards on trucks save lives. The introduction of side guards in London resulted in a 61% reduction of fatally injured cyclists and a 20% reduction of fatally injured pedestrians. We commend the Council for originating law in recent years that has made New York City's municipal fleet a market leader in truck side guard implementation. However, it is clear that installation of side guards in private vehicle fleets in particular is lacking far behind, exemplified by the lackluster implementation rates by private sanitation trucks. Uh, this legislation will help bring common sense, low cost, and life-saving technology to trucks operating in New York City to the benefit of pedestrians and bicyclists, as well as truck operators and their owners. And I want to thank you again for convening today's hearing, and we are uh, testifying in strong support of all the legislation heard today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good, uh, good morning, still. Um, my name is Eric McClure. I'm the executor, executive director of Streets PAC. And uh, thank you, Chair Rodriguez and Chair Richards, for holding this oversight hearing today and for the opportunity to testify. 2019 has been a very tough year for Vision Zero. We all knew or should have known that progress on Vision Zero would not be a straight line, but the increase in traffic deaths this year, especially among people on bikes, has been painful. It's also important to remember that when we're talking about Vision Zero, we're talking about the lives of our fellow New Yorkers. So a tough year for Vision Zero is a tough year for New Yorkers, and one death among us is one too many. We take a little bit of issue with the subject line for today's oversight hearing, Vision Zero, Cyclist Safety and Police Department Enforcement, because as we've testified at previous hearings, we believe that enforcement, especially by police officers, is the weakest and frankly least reliable aspect of Vision Zero. As we've stated in past hearings, our ability to achieve Vision Zero lies first and foremost in redesigning our streets. Vision Zero is predicated on the fact that people make mistakes and that those mistakes should not cost, one, cost someone life or limb. Preventing those mistakes is best done through street design, and as we've seen, many of the more than two dozen people killed on bikes this year were struck in, pla in places that had little, if any, cycling infrastructure. So I want to speak briefly to two bills that are not on today's docket, but have come before this body already. It's why we urge the speedy passage of Speaker Johnson's Intro 1557, which would create a five-year master plan for the city's streets, sidewalks, and pedestrian spaces. Key to the master plan is accelerating the building of protected bike lanes, the single best way to keep cyclists safe, as uh, Deputy Commissioner Beaton and Commissioner Trottenberg said earlier today. Intro 1557 should be brought to a vote ASAP. The same goes for the Reckless Driver Accountability Act, Councilmember Landers' bill that would impound or boot vehicles that accrue a significant number of dangerous camera violations. Automated enforcement is the one means of enforcement that does make a real difference in Vision Zero. We saw a surge in speed camera violations when expansion of the program began earlier this year, but violations quickly started to drop after each round of new camera deployments, as many drivers soon changed their behavior. Getting the most dangerous drivers off the road will greatly reduce the, the dangers faced by cyclists and pedestrians, as well as other drivers. Lastly, we did want to speak in support of all the legislation that had come before the committee today. We support Intro 769 in 2018, which would allow people to cure bicycle equipment violations within 48 hours by producing the required equipment. As Marco said earlier, um, safety is paramount and, and allowing people to avoid a ticket by uh, securing that equipment uh, in a timely manner after an infraction um, would be much preferable to just slapping them with a fine. Um, we also support Intro 1435, requiring safety belt usage, Intro 5286, which would accelerate the timeline for required side guards, and, and we share the, the concern that it's just taking too long for this important safety measure to get done. Um, and finally, we do support the three-foot passing requirement. Uh, we have some concerns about how enforcement will happen with that, um, but it does set a standard, which the, the law currently lacks, and is an important piece in educating drivers. Um, and lastly, we, uh, we do support Councilmember Holden's bill that would require spill guards on cement trucks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, pre pressure button. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Lauren Pine, and I'm here today with Families for Safe Streets. Less than two years ago, I was crossing with the light with my bicycle when I was struck and dragged by a 10-wheel Mack truck who's making a right turn. Fortunately, bystanders were able to stop the vehicle. The driver did not even see me. I was awake the entire time. My left leg was pinned under the driver's side tire. I was rushed to Bellevue Hospital where they saved my life and performed a rare amputation called a hip disarticulation that they only do when there's no other option due to the poor prognosis. My pelvis was fractured and due to infection, they couldn't repair it from the inside, so it is healed crooked, making sitting painful. My bladder was also badly damaged, <laughs> requiring me to be near a bathroom at all times now and to wear pads. The skin on my right leg was torn off on almost the entire upper thigh. I, went, I underwent extensive skin grafting from my back, and I stayed in the ICU for two months. I live alone, and even with good insurance, did not have enough home care. My family had to come from the West Coast, risking their jobs to care for me during the first year. I underwent extensive inpatient and outpatient rehab, and I still have nerve damage in my right leg. My prosthetic leg weighs 17 pounds and costs $100,000. It is not covered by Medicare which I will go on in a month. Disability is not a living wage. Accessoride is torture. By contrast, trucks privately owned like the one that struck me can carry as little as $1 million insurance. That's before medical and legal costs. This is for a truck capable of causing major damage very easily. The driver who struck me was driving with a suspended license. Crashes with resulting tragedies like this are preventable. The silver lining is that even if I cannot return to my former career as a nurse caring for patients in a cancer hospital, I can use my voice to support things like the initiative for side guards on large vehicles to protect cyclists and pedestrians. I hope you will all use your power to make this simple, life-saving solution a reality. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And, um... I mean, there are no words. But thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for your courage. And we're gonna do everything to make sure. Wow. Thank you. I'm actually forfeiting my, um, my time to speak right now because of reading the names earlier. So thank you for your time. That there's no one from because also that they also do with the city fleet. They're responsible for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next panel, Kendall from New Yorkers for Responsible Management, Melissa Icon, NYLPI, Lauren Paterno, uh, AAA. Stephen Levy, Levy, a trucking association in New York. Joseph Ferreira.
you may begin. Melissa, ladies first. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Rodriguez, Council Member um, Donovan Richards, and members of both of your committees for the opportunity to testify. Today I'm gonna focus my testimony on the pre-considered intro requiring side guards on all city contracted vehicles and trade waste vehicles by no later than January 2021. I work at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest where I'm a senior staff attorney and we are a member of the Transform Don't Trash NYC Coalition. We are strongly supportive of this and other measures aiming to make our streets safer for all New Yorkers. As you all know, private sanitation trucks are amongst the heaviest, largest, and most dangerous vehicles operating on our streets. Sadly, our study of federal crash data show that the rate of serious and fatal crashes involving major trade waste companies in New York City more than doubled from the 2014-2016 period to the 2016-2018 to period. The inherent dangers of operating heavy vehicles in a dense city are exacerbated by the current inefficient and exploitative commercial waste system. Under the current waste collection system, trade waste routes are notoriously inefficient. In fact, the Department of Sanitation estimates that the transition from an open market to a zoned commercial waste system will eliminate about 18 million unnecessary miles per year. The dangers to New York City residents associated with these aging, heavy-duty trucks driven by exhausted workers are most acute in environmental justice communities. These communities host transfer stations, recycling facilities, truck yards, and garages, and in addition to suffering from the highest concentration of air pollution and large amount of trucks constantly traversing their streets, their residents are also at greatest risk of being struck, killed, or maimed by these commercial waste trucks. Despite the inherent danger of these trucks, Thousands of these vehicles operate without basic side guards in place, an inexpensive and simple measure that can mean the difference between life and death for pedestrians and cyclists. In fact, data published by the Business Integrity Commission in September 2019 showed that just 15% of the private, sanita private sanitation truck fleet licensed to operate in New York City has had side guards installed, 15%. We are optimistic that the proposed Commercial Waste Zones Bill, Intro 1574A, will require many of the city's private sanitation companies to adopt safer, cleaner truck fleets over the next 10 years. However, in the meantime, immediate installation of side guards is a common sense protection that all city contracted and trade waste trucks should have. We urge the council to immediately vote this bill into law and thank you again for having this hearing. Uh, Council Member uh, uh, Rodriguez and uh, Richards, my name is Kendall Christensen. I'm here on behalf of New Yorkers for Responsible Waste Management, which is a consortium of about 25 locally owned private carting companies that handle commercial waste, uh, which is a subset of what uh, Melissa was just uh, speaking about. I wanted to just give you just a quick snapshot on behalf of that subset, uh, which is about um, uh, the uh, Depending on who you talk to, uh, you've heard, probably heard that there are 90 companies licensed to handle commercial waste in the city. The current reality is there are about 50 that actually do it, uh, and the uh, concentration is about 25 of them have about 99% of the market share in the service uh, in the city, and those are the companies that I primarily represent. Uh, of those, looking at uh, big data recently, uh, because this is all on the city's uh, porthole, uh, those uh, 50 companies have about 560 rear end loader trucks, uh, otherwise known as packer trucks, not thousands. Uh, BIC uh, overall licenses and registers about 7,500 heavy duty trucks in the city, but they are not all private sanitation trucks, not all private carters. Only about, uh, again, 25 to 50 of those companies are in the commercial waste business and the number of packer trucks they operate, or have license, I should say, because they're not on the, all on the street every night, uh, is about 560. There are some additional container trucks uh, that those companies operate. They also operate other types of trucks, you know, panel trucks and box trucks and pickups and the like. Uh, but in total, uh, that uh, subset of about 50 companies only has about 1,000 trucks that are registered or licensed, excuse me, licensed by BIC. Uh, and those 50 companies, just to, to give you, a, again, a deeper snapshot, fall into two categories. Uh, about half of them have three trucks or less and fewer than 1,000 customers, and they have trucks that are probably not going to be compliant with Local Law 145 clean engine requirements, 
when they become effective in January, and we're anticipating uh, strict enforcement by BIC on those companies, which means about 25 of those companies will uh, uh, largely disappear from providing commercial waste services in a few months. Of the 25 that are left, those are companies with four trucks or more and over 1,000 customers. Uh, and my review of that data shows that uh, as of a couple of weeks ago, that 320 of those 560 trucks, which is about 56%, already have site guards installed. Of the uh, larger companies, uh, we're 60% uh, we're or above, four years in advance of the current deadline. Let me stop here and be clear that we support uh, an acceleration of the deadline for side guard installations. Uh, I was not part of the original discussion several years ago. I've been working with the industry now over the last three or four years. So I wasn't aware of the, uh, of the dynamics around the setting of the 2024 standard, uh, but we would be very supportive of accelerating that to 2021. Uh, again, most of the companies are already uh, well on the way to compliance uh, for the subset of companies that are most concerned to, uh, uh, to, uh, the, to this panel. Um, there is a concern about container trucks and whether or not, uh, uh, given their various configurations, uh, about the applicability of side guards, and that's a separate discussion that we're having with BIC and other agencies about uh, how to accommodate uh, that situation. Uh, I guess a final comment is that one of the things that is now inhibiting the uh, investment, uh, for better or for worse, in uh, side guards on additional trucks is the uncertainty over the outcome of the commercial waste zone planning uh, debate that uh, is coming to a head with the council over the next week or so. Uh, for the companies that do not literally know whether they will be in business a year or two from now, uh, it's a severe inhibitor about investing in anything they're absolutely not required to do. Um, and uh, that's uh, a, a problem across the industry. It's been the case for the last couple of years as the commercial waste zone debate has been uh, uh, f uh, percolating, uh, and we uh, hope that it, that will be resolved so the industry can return to its operations and to making uh, these kinds of investments again uh, very soon in the future. Thank you very much. Wow, we almost got y'all to agree. <laughs> Pardon me? It's a miracle. You and Melissa almost agreed on something. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's like a miracle. Christmas came early. That's a miracle, but uh, here we go. Thank you. <laughs> um, but I, I appreciate you uh, saying you support. We, just, we, do, we disagree about the numbers because there is a tendency to link together all BIC registered and licensed companies into one category, and actually they fall into about a dozen different subcategories, as Melissa knows from her time at BIC. Yeah. Uh, and so private waste companies, uh, private carters, often get lumped into that larger category including when there are accidents and the like, which reminds me of just one final point. Uh, we have had a productive conversation with BIC over time about uh, our drivers helping BIC, helping DOT, I should say, helping DOT identify uh, troubled intersections. Okay. Uh, our drivers are on the street. They see those uh, intersections when there are problems, and we have a, a, a process now of communicating to DOT uh, when we can make that identification and be helpful to them in that process. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Lauren Paterno. I represent AAA. AAA is a nonprofit motor club which uh, serves drivers throughout the five boroughs of New York City. I want to thank the committees for um, the opportunity to testify today and to Councilman Rodriguez for sponsoring intro 1435, requiring the use of backseat safety belts in motor vehicles. Uh, AAA commends the city for taking steps to further protect passengers in New York City roadways. Current New York State law only requires children under 16 to buckle up in the back seat, yet proper restraints enhance safety for all vehicle occupants regardless of age. In 2018, 33 individuals 16 and over were killed and 2,400 were injured because they were not buckled up in the back seat. This accounts for approximately six injuries per day across New York State. Over 1,500 or over 60% of those injuries occurred on New York City roadways. Unbelted rear seat occupants are three times more likely to be killed, eight times more likely to be seriously injured, and two times more likely to kill the front seat passenger by becoming a projectile in the vehicle. Uh, we appreciate that the legislation includes uh, vehicles licensed to operate by the Taxi and Limousine Commission. According, according to IIHS, less than 60% of individuals surveyed reported wearing a seatbelt in the backseat of a four-hire vehicle. 
However, close to 80% of individuals report wearing a seatbelt in a personal motor vehicle. It is important for both types of vehicles to be included under the law as the same risks apply regardless of the kind of vehicle a passenger is traveling in. Um, AAA strongly supports the legislative intent of uh, intro 1435, however we do suggest the removal of Part B, which requires the driver to be ticketed along with the unbelted passenger. Current state law only mandates that the unrestrained occupant receive the ticket. This legislation would, this, this should, the legislation should mirror state law to ensure enforcement and community, community compliance is as easy and as clear as possible. We appreciate New York City's leadership on traffic safety and the opportunity to comment today. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman Rodriguez, Chairman Richards, staff, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, my name is Stephen Levy. I'm testifying for Kendra, Hol Kendra Helms, who is the president of the Trucking Association of New York. Uh, you have the full testimony. I'm going to highlight some important points of the testimony. Uh, first and foremost, TANI has, um, has 600 very diverse members in the state of New York and is a nonprofit for 85 years. We're proud to invest in safety and make all roads safe for people of New York City and throughout the state of New York. The trucking industry invests approximately $10 billion a year uh, in, in equipment and safety initiatives, including collision avoidance systems, electronic logging devices, and onboard video event recorders. The three bills of specific interest today is intro 1763, 1354, and the pre-considered bill of T2019-5286, which will have a significant impact in our industry. With regards to 1763, we believe the council should take into account the real life implications of traveling down New York City streets and might consider not only to have a minimum of three feet between the vehicle and the bicycle, but also suggest where it's possible to do so. Relating to 1354, there are current, two current laws on the books today relating to the environmental issues as well as weight of different trucks. Uh, the environmental side basically requires cement vehicles to go in and out of a cement plant, clean, clean when they enter, clean when they leave. And there's also a weight statute on, the con on, the truck, on a concrete truck, which also relates back to the quantity of gallons they can have on that truck. Perhaps what is needed, enforcement of these two new rules, of these two uh, laws instead of adding another. But of much concern for us, and uh, which we've seen much testimony today, uh, and significant as that, is the, rail, uh, is the rail guards. Today, there are no uniform standards and specifications for the use of side guards and installation. Another concern is that legislation attempts to address the issue of safety in a one-size-fits-all one for all trucks. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, the engineering expertise is not simply there. There are no uniform standard or measure that constitutes an appropriate side guard for a given truck while safety implications are still largely unknown. We believe that more information and fact-based data is needed before this bill moves particularly when considering the extremely high costly nature of the equipment, coupled with the already high cost of doing business in the city, and not to divert funds from potential other electronic collision avoidance systems available. We look forward to continuing to work with City Council uh, in the future, and also to focus on expanding pedestrian and cyclist safety programs that are designed to change behavior and promote safe practices. Thank you. Can you just go into, uh, or uh, Mr. Kendall, you can answer this too, how much does the DOT commissioner mention that there's a few hundred dollars for side guards? Can you just go into how much on average would it cost to install a side guard? You wanna go first? Um, I, I don't know exactly. Uh, my understanding is it's not a few hundred, it's a few thousand, but it's probably not more than five. 
And uh, I've been waiting for data, data from BIC on the utilization of the incentive program that they've operated uh, with some federal funds over the last couple of years, but that's uh, forthcoming. We agree for between one and 5,000, but the unique uh, situation we're in in New York City, that many of the vehicles, the trucks, are designed especially for New York City. For example, uh, fuel trucks, they're built. There isn't one particular make and model uh, that you can pick off a shelf, let alone the, uh, the experience of installers here as well. And uh, the uh, American Trucking Association is also working with the federal government as well in trying to do more research and come up with a program. But do you, you do share our goal here, Absolutely. right? I, I think you protect your workers. One, I mean, first, obviously, the public, but your workers are also protected to a great sense as well. If there are no fatalities or less accidents, I would hope that we all a share th that. A thousand percent, um, but with the understanding too that because of the structure of vehicles, very heavy, very large. It's still not clear on what side guards, what composition they should be made of, and how are they going to affect the structure of a vehicle as well, because you don't want to have a vehicle that it might work well within uh, in Manhattan and then go on to the Major Deegan or on 95, and then it defeats its purpose, breaks off, and then causes another casualty. I'm more happy to to continue having conversation with you and your members. And as you know, we are committed to do whatever we have to do in the city to improve the safety of pedestrians and cyclists. But, you know, let's get a time to talk. Thank you. We Thank appreciate you. that. Thanks, Thank you. And with that, uh, this hearing is adjourned.